Hi, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. In this episode, it is Thursday, January 21st, 2021, starting at 5.23 p.m. in Denver, Colorado, and this is the 288th episode of the show. So joining me today are um, Ian and Shay from the Camp Education Podcast, and we're going to be talking about the topic of explaining astrology to non-astrologers, or how an astrologer would go about answering some skeptical questions about astrology. Uh, so hey guys, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us on, man. We're really excited to be here. Yeah, thank you. So um, so the genesis of this episode is that you guys have a podcast called Camp Reeducation, which is available at campreeducation.com, and you approached me about uh, being a guest on your show because you do these um, episodes each month where you investigate different sort of weird um, topics or weird categories, and then you sometimes talk to people or interview people that have a background in that subject. And we thought that it might be a good crossover episode that will appear on both of our podcasts. But could you guys explain a little bit what your show is about? Yeah, sure. So Ian and I, we do what we call camps. They're two-week immersions into various topics. And uh, we've done all kinds of different things. The, the, the idea primarily is to challenge our preconceptions and our biases. Um, you know, obviously, we all go through life and we all collect these beliefs. And so our idea through the podcast is to challenge those beliefs and kind of examine where we got them from. So we've done, um, we've done makeup, we've done demon summoning, we've done 24 hour live streaming, we've done QAnon, K pop, um, tons of things. And yeah, Ian and I just try and, um, I don't know, understand why we believe the way we do and 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 challenge those initial understandings and interpretations of the things that are. Okay, and I think I'm actually following the QAnon episode, so that's a, that's a hard act to follow. Uh, <laughs> the, the timing was was wild because as soon as we started doing it, the, the day that our first episode was released, the 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 Capitol building the was Capitol stormed. The Capitol was stormed, yeah. So, oh my yeah. god, yeah. So and then it went from being like a fun um, like LARPing thing to like there are, people are actually trying to take over the government. You know what's yeah. so interesting is like we were reading the week before we read on all these message boards that like you know we're going to storm the Capitol we're going to Washington we're taking over and we we're just like these people are crazy they're not going to do this and then we right. watched it happen and we were like oh my god they were serious they weren't kidding right so that did that make you want to like go back and re-record the interview to be a little bit like <laughs> e easier easier on it uh, um, yeah I don't think so <laughs> no okay. <laughs> We, well, yeah, we 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 hightailed it out of Q and on land. Like we we couldn't leave that camp fast enough. Yeah. yeah okay. Well, I hope not to pull anything similar to you. I don't have any um, coups like scheduled in the near future. So well, why are we even here, Chris? What are I we know, doing exactly? <laughs> um, so I like the the premise of your show because I respect the idea of not necessarily taking things for granted, or at least recognizing when you are, and then attempting to educate yourself on on a subject and then just seeing where you come out of it. Maybe you'll have a different opinion or maybe you won't, but that kind of fits interestingly with a goal that I've always had, which is just learning how to communicate what astrology is and what I do better to people that don't have any background in it. So that's part of my interest in doing this episode and part of my goal for our discussion is just to sort of see how good I am at doing that. So <laughs> let's See what happens. How long you you guys are about halfway into your immersion right now? Yeah, exactly. We normally try and end. Uh, so we 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 do our first week and just try and figure out as much as we can. And then normally the second week of it, we bring in the big guns. You in this case, you know, to to help set us straight. And uh, typically we make a lot of mistakes in the first week, so uh, there's normally a lot of cleanup to be done. So. Uh, I think I think one of the things we hadn't anticipated into going into this project was just how hard it is to like let go of of beliefs and 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 biases. Like you you know you you kind of build a, your foundation of reality on like a, a number of beliefs that you kind of inherit passively. And then when you when you have to pull them out of the Jenga block that is your self-concept, you're like, oh my God, I have to put this back. Like the whole thing is coming down. <laughs> so. Yeah. One of the things that's weird when it comes to something like astrology that's been around for so long and that it's influenced culture in so many different ways, it's, it's often hard to even realize how many different preconceptions that you have about the subject going into it just because they're so thoroughly diffused in different parts of our society when it comes to philosophy or religion or um, you know science or mathematics or anything else. So it's kind of interesting seeing what your perspective will be coming out the other other side of that. So you guys have already released episode one. 
yeah. uh, yesterday, and you usually do like a three part series on each topic. Yeah, we actually just recently changed. We found that three weeks was just too much for people. You know, it was too much for us, to be honest, just uh, of talking about the same thing. So we broke it down. So this will be the uh, the second episode, the second and final one coming out here uh, next week as, as well. Yeah. Okay, got it. Well, um, so one of the questions I had to start before we jump into your questions, and you sent me a set of questions uh, already before we talk today, was um, what you know, what's your process for when you get into a new field in terms of, I know you guys have exposed yourself over the past week to different forms of astrology in order to see what you think of them, but um, how did you decide what to study or what to look into versus what not to, especially for such a large field? Um, spe- specifically with astrology and like not the not the other things that we had covered or? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I'm curious if you do have a general philosophy in general in terms of how you target if you have a limited amount of time, um, if you try to seek recommendations from authorities, if you try to just study whatever seems most relevant by Googling it or something, or what. I guess that would be one of my concerns if you just like jumped into astrology in general without any sort of advice or pointers or anything like that, is there's a lot of pop astrology stuff out there, and then there's yeah. um, different sort of gradations of more advanced or intricate things. So, I mean, I guess like the first thing I I, I do, and, and Shay and I are a bit different, like I think Shay is more methodical, Shay is more scientific, and I'm more interested in like the cultural aspect. So I'll absolutely dive in kind of as like a cultural anthropologist and be like, what are we talking about when we talk about astrology? So it's like, for me, I went on like a lot of forums. I watched a lot of documentaries. I read uh, a a ton of articles, like uh, blog posts, scientific stuff. And it's more just like, um, you know, what are people like, really, it's more an interest in like what astrology means to people, not necessarily the, the science of astrology. So for astrology, this is absolutely the approach that I took. And I think we both kind of took this week because astrology like you had mentioned it is so it, it's so huge and it's so vast and it's like there's so much we need to know i don't know that we could have completely like dived in um with without some sort of some sort of guidance some things were easier we did um like with makeup camp it was it was simple we bought a bunch of makeup and we learned how to put it on with like demon summoning we like bought a bunch of demonology books and learned how to summon demons with we did a, a camp on microdosing LSD, which was also pretty straightforward. Like we just microdosed LSD for uh, 30 days and, and, you know, kept track of, of what was happening. So, I mean, for this one, I think we, we looked first into the, the cultural phenomenon or the cultural aspects. And now we're trying to dig into like the, uh, the mechanics, so to speak. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. Um, and what have you done or seen so far? Like where are you currently at in that process? Well, I think like in our first episode that we just released, it's pretty clear that we are disenfranchised still. We're having a tough time suspending our disbelief. Um, we're both atheists primarily, and well, atheists, and I'm a Satanist as well. So we have like these like conflicting, like strong scientific kind of backgrounds to like our our beliefs. And um, one of the early things that was happening in in my process, at least, is that you know I'd go to Wikipedia and I look at the, the the there's so many articles on Wikipedia, and at first I had a tough time finding the ones that were relevant to astrology. I'm curious. I, I am so curious to hear what you have to say about the the astrology of Wikipedia pages, honestly. But so so many of <laughs> yeah, them. Yeah, there's a whole thing there. <laughs> yeah, I, I imagine. So many of them have this uh, caveat somewhere in them. That's that's basically it's like it's like the disclaimer. It's like the tobacco warning sign. It says science uh astrology is pseudoscientific that's like what it is in a nutshell and for me i take that and uh you know it's really hard for me to not take that and just like brush off my hands and be like i'm done wikipedia says it's not real and like and let go so and that's where i was the last couple days and so i'm and right now i'm really just trying and this is this is a little bit less about like the studying it but it's really more about just like how do i shake that feeling that just feels so inherently it's like this is BS and how do I go from there and just be like open myself up to this possibility that something is real and so that's like this more I guess emotional internal struggle side that I'm having when when dealing with astrology so far. Sure, that makes sense. Um, well, that raises there's a few things. I mean, one, I, I actually was very involved in editing Wikipedia pages and organizing different things like an astrology project at one point for astrologers and just people interested in the subject, like historians, to help organize the editing of so many different pages that needed to happen on Wikipedia in the mid-2000s, circa 
2004, 2005, but astrologers lost a battle there like a long time ago where the number of astrologers on Wikipedia was far outnumbered by the number of skeptics and people that didn't think that there was anything to astrology just because by um you know according to most polls when they do polls periodically of usually the way it's phrased is do you believe in astrology um usually it's only like 25% of the populace does and it it skews in different different demographics but it's something like that but with wikipedia specifically the skeptics were much more well organized and tended to win the Battles for the different pages on Wikipedia to the extent that a lot of astrologers, including myself, just sort of gave up and walked away from it at some point. Um, so that's one of the things in terms of Wikipedia is just you're going to get that perspective. And also, even a lot of astrology articles get deleted because they're viewed as not being important or not being sort of um, worthwhile information to keep. Which creates a kind of suppression effect, which is kind of surprising for Wikipedia, which is something that we don't even conceptualize like that. It's it, that's really interesting because I mean, um, one usually when we undergo these immersions, like there's always something that we don't kind of see coming. It's like, well, I didn't think I was going to end up thinking about this, and um, you know, in kind of suspending disbelief when approaching a subject there's always that barrier. And for me, it was like the science. And it, it, the big question I kind of kept asking myself this week is like, well, how much do I know about science? Because science is, is mimetic in the sense that like, yeah, like we get it. A study comes out and everyone's like, mm, yes. Uh, but you know, there, it, I, it turns out that like, it, it, and it's like, it's tough to admit, but like, I don't know that much about science. Like, yeah, I get it. But I mean, in terms of like my understanding of what it means for objective truth like it's 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 not on strong standing like there's certain science that like without a, a you know a moment's hesitation i'll believe like like right now for example we're in the middle of a pandemic and there are people that like refuse to wear their masks and like covid numbers are going up and the death number is rising so it's like you can immediately see the correlation and you're just like all right this is this is real i i believe in the science or like climate change and global warming like y- you can see immediately see that and go Yes, this is real, but like for other uh, things, it, it's more like, all right, like I I can't really measure this myself. I can't see this. Like I have to rely on a on a community and a, a process that like I myself don't know anything about. So you you kind of state this claim and stand on this ground that you're you have no standing on like yourself. Like you haven't done any of the work. So you're just like, well, like I just trust this. So that's the kind of the thing that I've um, been thinking about a lot this week is like, well, how much do I even know about like science when it says that? Uh, ignore this. Yeah, I mean, well, and that's one of the interesting things about your project is that it's doing something, ad- admitting something, going into it that people often have a very really hard time doing because it requires you to be humble, which is just knowing, identifying what you don't know, or when you're speaking about a subject that you actually don't have much background in. And acknowledging that, which is an uncomfortable thing to do, because people usually want to default to at least putting on the the pretense or appealing to authority or appealing to to something. Um, but to go back to the the Wikipedia thing, one of the issues with astrology is that astrology is is traditionally on the outs with both science and religion, which is kind of a weird double punch thing, where both religious many religious traditions like Christianity are. Um, uncomfortable or anti-astrology, and also um, astrology has been on the outs with the scientific community for a few centuries now. So that creates an awkward situation when you're coming to like public discussions when it comes to things like Wikipedia, because then you have both groups kind of like hanging up on astrology or astrology not really fully fitting into either one of those camps. And I know that that'll get to some of your questions later about is astrology science or is it religion, but. It's just a unique field in that way, and that it finds itself on the outskirts with with both of those. That is good. I mean, if, if it's okay with you, I I want to jump jump into that now because you you talking about this this I I never considered the idea of being like identifying as an astrologer and then having this dual fronted war against religion and science because I would imagine that you would be simpatico with the religious side. And that, that those would go walk hand in hand. But I guess like if you were thinking of a dogmatic 
or a more dogmatic uh, religious side, like maybe, let's let's say the Catholic Church, I can imagine that they think it's maybe heretical, or maybe that it's um, you know that you're you're claiming powers that don't belong within humanity or something like that. Um, so I, I, where does it sit then? So if it's not religion, if it's not science, or is it both, or or where what is its place then? Um. I mean, it'll get us into like a, an extended digression that we might not want to go to yet. But the, one of the issues with astrology is it often straddles different fields, and so it's a little bit of both, and it, it actually falls somewhere in between. And that might be part of its basic definition that makes it unique, and maybe even useful or worth studying in the world that it does have a foot in both of those camps when it comes to science and and maybe religion or what we conceptualize as religion, as well as other fields. Um, but with Christianity, part of the history there that's really interesting is that Christianity evolved during a period um, in the ancient Roman Empire when astrology was much more dominant. And at that point in time, astrology was much more deterministic and much more tied in with Stoicism. And the idea that the purpose of studying astrology was to learn your fate so that you knew what you had to accept about your future to sort of prepare you for it ahead of time. And Christianity, um, after the first century became very much focused on the concept of free will and the idea that you have a choice and that that's a central doctrine of just theology and Christianity. And that became one of the strongest points of antagonism where once Christianity um, became more of the dominant religion, astrology was one of the first things to go, not just due to that, but I think that was one of the central things. So it's interesting that that's one of the reasons why, from a religious standpoint, at least in terms of Christianity, why there's a, a tension there. It actually goes back to the fate and free will debate. That's funny, because I know Ian has been doing so much research into the free will stuff, and he really wants to pick your brain about that, I'm sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, we, when we had, the, we had a conversation yesterday with, a, with an amateur astrologer, and um, the conversation that we had essentially had about this was that, like, you know, um, religion essentially demands um, like you know, piety and faith. Like you're, you're supposed to have faith. Like you're, you're supposed to wait for God to kind of like reveal His plan. And and uh, astrology, as I kind of understood it, was essentially a cheat sheet. It was, it was like you know, kind of getting your looking in the back of the book and getting the answers more quickly. Which is why there seemed to be this uh, um, shunning of it within the Christian community. But it, it's interesting too because um, when we talk about like the free will thing, I, I, I do know that based on what I was uh, reading for for research. Um, there was this like uh, kind of push and pull in terms of uh, religious philosophers trying to figure out, well, like, well, do we have free will? Like, is would God uh, allow us to, you know, do things that are evil? Like, uh, did God give us free will so that we could prove whether or not, like, we love Him? Um, and it, it's interesting to kind of think about astronomy in this context because, like, is uh, you know, astrology restrictive in this sense? Like, it, does it? kind of uh, remove the question of free will if like your fate is as you kind of said just a moment ago de determined by the stars right um yeah and that's a really big question it's something astrologers have been debating and that there's a lot of different points of view on so I'll do my best to balance trying to speak in general for astrologers as much as I can with also acknowledging that there's many different, um, subgroups and different positions that one could take because of yeah, just just different positions and the same that there is in any field. Well, before you, guys... you answer generally, can can I ask um, where where do you personally stand on that? Like, what what are your thoughts on that? If that's not too personal a question, because I know that's that's like tough to answer. Like, hey, take a couple minutes and just tell me what you think of free will. So, yeah, I mean, it kind of gets to one of your some of your early questions, and I don't know if you guys want to jump into those because they build on each other quite well. But for me, um, the basic premise of natal astrology is that the alignment of the planets or the alignment of the cosmos at the moment that you were born has something significant to say about your life and your future. And if that premise is correct at all, even like 1% correct, then it would imply that there's at least some things that uh, the trajectory of re which might be, you could say, predetermined to some extent. Um, but to what extent is is more of an open question. Mm. So that's the question that you'd have to answer with astrology is one of your first questions was how do you define astrology and my definition of astrology is that it's the study of the correlation between celestial movements and earthly events and then the second one is um 
my definition of natal astrology or the concept of birth charts is that it's that the the premise is that the alignment of the planets at the moment that you're born has something to say about the future of your life. Yeah. So, yeah, that is uh, you know you, so so there's one so of many other like questions I want to dive ways, into but yeah. Right. But. Um, I understand that that sounds like an absurd premise, or it sounds like a premise at least that shouldn't be the case, or we don't have any immediate reason to th to think why that should work. Um, so one of the things that I've struggled with then is in observing that, and that's one of the the questions that I usually like to pose to people is not do you believe that, but have you observed that correlation as well? Because I think it is something that's observable. And is worth looking into if you haven't ever checked to see if that's true. Um, but the thing then that I've wrestled with is just since I have re repeatedly seen that being true, the question being why that should be the case, or what what would that mean about the the cosmos or the universe or our world if that was a true statement or true premise? And trying to figure that out has been one of my my long term things that I'm working on. I think that all astrologers are working on. So then where, where then does astrology fit primarily in your life then? Is it a guiding principle that you use as a doctrine that helps you with all decisions then? Or is it because we, we had this conversation quite a bit already with friends, with people that we spoke to just from the podcast. And we asked, like, is this something you believe in wholeheartedly? You, th you know, pedal to the metal like th these beliefs are true or is it a grain of salt type of mentality? Like what? I don't know. How how do you reconcile these different opinions coming from so many different? I guess not even different opinions, different interpretations of the same field of belief. And it, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, and it's it's tricky because also if you're talking to like friends of the podcast, then there's a whole range of different levels of people's like interest and background in astrology and what role it plays in their life and how much they're familiar with it or how much they. Think that they're familiar with it versus like objectively compared to like let's say somebody else who's studied it or has a PhD in in the history of astrology or something like that. There's all sorts of different levels that people are approaching that question from. Um, for me, it does play a major role in my life. Although I usually try to center primarily just making decisions based on what seems to be the most sensible thing at the time, and I will. Check the astrology and just see and notice the correlations of what is happening at that point. And if I make a decision and it ends up working out, what was the correlation with that versus if I make a decision and that turned out to be a huge mistake or disaster, what was the correlation with that at my chart at that time? And then I usually learn something from that going forward. And that's usually most of the time how I like to approach it. I, so as someone who grew up Catholic, you know, there's there's the, uh, the the joke about like the Catholic guilt. Like, is there ever a sort of like situation or time where like you read something in your chart and it's like now is a good time to do something, and you're like I'll do it later, and then you know something goes afoul or something doesn't work out, and you're like I really should have you know followed up on that. Is that something that happens fairly often or is common? Um, yeah, I mean it's tricky because that gets into there's different branches of astrology. There's there's like natal astrology, which is looking at your chart, your birth chart itself, which has something to say about your your life as a whole in its totality. And then there's also timing techniques that you can apply to your life in order to attempt to find out when certain things will happen. There's a separate branch or application of astrology that's known as electional astrology, which is where you um you cast a chart for the moment that you started new. Like a major venture or undertaking, and the premise is that the alignment of the chart or the planets at that moment will describe what you're initiating and some things about its future. So that's been a branch that I've been more interested in lately because it's just an extension of the concept of natal charts, but it um, implies that natal charts are something. It's a property that's inherent in like time that applies to all major things that have like a birth or a moment of origin. Um, and and to me that gets more into like getting to the center of what astrology actually is and what it's about, and it's something about um, time having qualitative properties for some reason. And I've been trying to figure out how to articulate that better for a long time, but that's the closest I can get to it at, at this point. Interesting. So I, 
you know, there's this one question that I keep coming back to specifically, and that's, and you're kind of touching on it with this idea of election, uh, elect, it's electional astrology. Is that, is that right? Yeah. To, to elect or the other word for elect is to make a choice to choose. And electional astrology is the application of astrology where you choose to initiate an action at one moment versus choosing to start it at another moment. So, for example, starting, if I were to start writing a book, Today versus if I start writing a book, that, that's more abstract. But let's say if I got married, you get married to somebody, and you're officially now, you know, in a permanent, even legally binding relationship. And the notion that the alignment of the planets could have something to say about the, you know, success or failure of your marriage based on getting married, let's say last in December when there was the Jupiter Saturn conjunction that everybody could see in the sky, versus let's say you had chosen to get married. Last March of 2020, when there was an alignment of Saturn and Pluto and Jupiter and Mars in the sign of Capricorn that all lined up in the sky, which in retrospect turned out to be when the US had the lockdowns and the coronavirus sort of swept through the world. Wow. Well, then it sounds like you're saying that, going, even going back to what you're we talking about before, that there's, there's a predictability to this, that, that you're you're divining, and I guess you know from the the idea of divination, which we keep like I keep seeing over and over again in in this research, like you're you're divining things about the future, and and I guess you're even talking about like time as a qualitative uh, as a qualitative substance, I guess is what you said. Like does it all does astro like point blank? If if you had to like describe it to me as as a total noob in this, like does astrology predict the future? Um. Yeah, I think you can predict the future with astrology, and that's one of the most interesting and promising things about it is that if it's true that certain moments of time have qualitative properties, and especially that, let's say, certain planetary alignments like the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction, which just took place, um, it just happened in December, and it only happens every 20 years. They have like a 20-year cycle where they go around the zodiac and then meet up from our standpoint, and these two little what look like stars suddenly line up with each other in the sky, um, and then something happens and you observe what events happen in the world that are major events at that time, uh, the thing is that if that premise is true, that the alignment of those two planets in December indicated or correlated with some events that happened on Earth at that time, that's not the only time that those two planets aligned, but actually if you wanted to, you could go back in history in 20-year increments and see what happened 20 years ago in the year 2000, the last time that Jupiter and Saturn lined up. And then you can take that back and look and see what happened 20 years before that in the year 1980. And you can take that back centuries and just keep watching to see, are there any events that happened that are similar, similar or the same? And if so, if you accumulate enough of those observations, really empirical observations about what happened on Earth that coincided with certain planetary alignments in the past, then what you can do eventually is you can project that out into the future and you can say, well, 20 years from now, I know astronomically, because the movements of the planets are fixed, we know where the planets are going to be in a century or two or three centuries, and you can project that out and say, I would expect this type of event to happen next time 20 years from now when that same planetary alignment occurs. So that's just one example, but there's many different planetary alignments that are happening at different rates, you know, all the time. Yeah. This this might be uh, a beginner's error, but I feel like a lot of what I'm seeing uh, and, and researching is that like each planet uh, essentially like stands for something, represents something, and and like uh, when it lines up with something else, it, it means something or it entails something. And like one of the things I uh, am, am dying to know is like how did that come to fruition? Is that is that a real thing? And if so, like how did that come to fruition? Like who, where was that ordained? Sure. So um, it's complicated because ha some of it is based on empirical observations of astrologers seeing that you know this alignment of planets coincided with this the, either the last time they saw it in their own life, if it was something that happened like a year or two ago, or if they study history, if it's an outer a slow moving outer planet alignment, then just looking through history, there's some books like um, one famous book is Cosmos and Psyche by Richard Tarnas. And he went through in history because his background was in 
he wrote a, a famous book in like 1990 called The Passion of the Western Mind, where he went through and studied um, just the development of Western philosophy and Western thinking through history. Um, and he won like some awards for that book, and it became a commonly assigned college textbook. But it turned out that that book was actually a precursor for this other book on astrology that he wanted to write, where he would show how major planetary alignments of outer planets coincided with some of those important turning points in history that he had just observed by comparing those planetary alignments to history textbooks and what we know about major shifts. So there's a part of astrology that's empirical. It's an inherited or accumulated empirical tradition of astrologers um, making observations and then writing those things down. And that goes back to about 2000 to 3000 BCE, when in Mesopotamia or modern day Iraq, there were some sky observers who began noticing correlations in the sky and they began writing them down on like clay tablets. And slowly they accumulated these tablets in libraries over the centuries until it became just part of a not just an oral tradition, but a, a written empirical tradition. So that's half of it. And that to me is, is broadly speaking, a, a sort of scientific eff effort because it's a type of empiricism of making observations and then writing them down and passing that on to see if those observations hold up in the future. So that's definitely part of it when it comes to the planets. The other part of your answer, though, is there is a symbolic, and this ties into the background of astrology and divination, but a um, a tendency to, to to look at astronomical movements and then Im interpret them symbolically, um, and using a type of symbolic thinking in order to interpret what that means. So I'm trying to think of of an example, but um, like an example would be that that that's not too complicated. I'm trying to think of um, a simple one. So one of them is like. The fifth century astrologer Rhetorius, when a planet that was associated with marriage is said to be hidden or obscured by the sun so that you can't see it with the naked eye, then he interpreted it as meaning that the person's marriage at some point in the future when they grew up would happen in secret, that there would be something hidden about the natives' relationships or love life. So, because the planet itself was hidden or obscured, Visibly, if you were to try to look into the sky to see it at the moment that that person was born, it was then interpreted as indicating that something would be hidden or obscured about that part of the person's life. And that's a major component to astrology in terms of how some pieces of it are developed, is it has to do with um, that basic premise that some parts of the natural world can um, have symbolic meaning that is relevant to people's lives. I guess something that's hard for me to wrap my head around is I can see that you can look at an event like this and say, okay, the the marriage planet is invisible now, or it's you know hiding behind the sun. That must mean that there will be this this um, this thing here, or this event later in life related to marriage and hiding. I, I can understand thematically how those are tied. I think what I have a hard time understanding, and maybe it's just that there there's there's not. There's not science to back this up, or I'm, you know, I'm now even just saying the word science to back it up. I'm wondering if maybe I'm like using the wrong language already. But my question is like, what is the mechanism then that determines that or that that affects it? Like, what physically happens from the 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 planet being in this particular spot in the sky? Like, what is the phys the physics the physical mechanics that affects my personality or my fate? Yeah, that's a really important question because that comes to a really core issue that's been a long-standing 2,000-year um, debate in astrology and where it's usually taken as either one or the other, and it shifts over time over history, which is the question of what is the mechanism underlying astrology and does astrology, the debate traditionally has been framed as does astrology work as a result of causes or as a result of signs? So are the planets and the stars and other astronomical astronomical phenomenon that that astrologers are looking at, um, are they causing events to happen through some sort of force or some sort of um, unknown you know, mechanism? Or um, are the stars and planets and other astronomical phenomenon simply acting as um, signs through some sort of um, principle that's not very well defined, but that some astrologers like the psychologist Carl Jung attempted to formulate a definition or a conceptualization of it through the principle of synchronicity, 
where he said that um, two things can coincide in time and share a similarity of meaning, and that connection between the similarity of meaning and the coinciding at that moment of time is sufficient for there to be a connection, and there doesn't have to be a physical mechanism that's exchanged between them for there to be a meaningful coincidence of events. So um, that's very sounds very vague in general, but it's basically just postulating that there may not be a mechanism behind astrology so much as it's just the study of correlations of things that should be unrelated, but for some reason they're actually um, lining up in synchronicity with similar meanings at that moment in time. Just out of curiosity, um, Shay, I know I cut you off, but I- I'm just wondering too. Like, uh, you know, I looked through some of your podcast episodes as well, and I- and I know it-, it. I am under the impression that there's like a lot of different schools of thought on this. So, I mean, in terms of what you just mentioned, like w- uh, my question, I guess, is like, how much consensus uh, is there on this stuff? Like, are are there a lot of uh, competing ideologies about what these things mean, or is it is it usually is it pretty unified overall? The underlying problem is that most astrologers are just people that use a technology that they can see that works and they see the outcome and the results of it, but they don't know how it's working in the same way that you or I could use a microwave and we have some general idea of like how it works and how to make it work by just like putting the food in and heating it up. But if somebody asked you to explain the actual like physical mechanism underlying why your food heats up in like 60 seconds, um, I, I have like a hard time explaining that, which is maybe slightly embarrassing, but maybe it just is a is a side effect of you know the things that we take for granted at this point in terms of technology and in terms of sometimes you can use something or let's say drive a car, even just like driving a car as a tool in order to get something done without necessarily knowing the full mechanics of how it works, because what's most important. For the end user is just that the thing does what it what it's supposed to do or what you're trying to do with it, regardless of if you know exactly like how how that happened. That's the issue that you're, you run into with most astrologers and especially most astrology enthusiasts. Is it's not something where they're super. I don't want to say I don't want to say thinking super deeply about the mechanics, but it's not their primary concern. Because just the fact that it works and you can do some things with it at all is in and of itself kind of interesting and takes a lot of time and focus. So there's a lot of debates and there's a lot of um, people people that might have very like somewhat shallow responses to it because they haven't thought through their answers or looked through like the history of the subject because that's really just not their primary focus. I guess a natural progression for that too is beyond even just like uh, competing schools of thought. I know that um, you know there's the Chinese zodiac as well, which is like a completely different system um, where your personality is is based on what year you're born. And um, I guess I'm just you know curious to know what uh, I, it feels weird to say like you know Western astrologers' thoughts are on that. But I mean, yeah, like how do these things uh, complement each other, uh, contradict each other? Like how much credence do you think one gives to the other? Um, yeah, I mean, there's many different traditions of astrology that developed around the world, sometimes occasionally independently. So, for example, there's like Mayan astrology, which developed in uh, the what is it, the American subcontinent or in Mesoamerica, sort of independently from Europe and the West and Asia and everything else. But then um, when it comes to Europe and the Middle East and like India and China, there were oftentimes indigenous traditions of astrology that developed there just by them repeating the same process of like observing a correlation between celestial movements and earthly events and sometimes structuring it differently in the same way a really good analogy is that there's different languages um, that that developed in different cultures that work in different ways or have different gra- grammatical syntax but they still accomplish the same thing which is communication um, and it's not necessarily that one language is better. There might be some languages that are more efficient for doing certain things, but just because there's different languages or, or one language is different, it doesn't necessarily negate or mean that you know another language. It just means that they're structured differently and they had different origins. So astrology as a language is a common analogy that's used to describe different astrological traditions and why they 
are different and yet can still be useful or valid in different ways. And I think that's a, a worthwhile analogy. Another thing to mention is that on the European and Middle Eastern and, and Asian subcontinent or Asian continent, there's a lot of um, exchange between different astrologies, and um, a lot of texts would go from like one language or one culture, and they would be transmitted to another. So there's actually a lot more connections in the history of astrology between some of these different traditions than you would think or realize. And there may be some connection between Chinese astrology and Mesopotamian astrology that goes very far back. So I'm not entirely sure. Like Chinese astrology is not something that I specialize in or have studied a lot, um, but there may be some slight like background tradition there, background connection. It may not be as completely independent as it seems like it is. I. I- I do have one. I want to bring us back a little bit to this this question of the mechanism that's behind it. And I know you you use this this metaphor of like how a, a car works, and um and we we and I guess that the point there is to illustrate that like we we know it works, but we don't necessarily know how. But right. it, I feel like we 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 see correlation in these planetary happenings. So for instance, the the example you give, um, again, about the, the two outer planets, I guess Jupiter and Saturn um, uniting, I'm not sure the technical term for it, but we see this as significant and then we look for significance happening here. We say, okay, something significant is happening out there. Where mm. is the significance here? And I wonder if we're, if, if you were looking for the correlation where there might not necessarily be one, I know this is like this is something that I guess probably goes to like the root of a lot of questions. Is like, is there a form of confirmation bias here where you know, um, you know, air quotes, there should be something happening here? Okay, let's go find it. And then you look, you know, twenty. Let's say hypothetically, it's twenty years in the past. Something was supposed to happen. Where is the event? Like, I feel like that that is a hard. That is a hard question that I struggle to overcome. Like, how is this not, I guess, a form of confirmation bias? Yeah, that's a major, um, a potential issue and a major, you know, um, obstacle. Where, especially when you're looking at worldwide events, where there's just so many things happening at any given time, if you're looking to see if there is a correlation um, that you might be able to find it, or that you might. Reach like somebody could be accused of like reaching and saying, "Well, this was the correlation," and it's like, you know, not very strong or um, not exactly what they were saying it was going to be ahead of time or something like that. So confirmation bias is definitely a potential issue, and it's also usually assumed to be by skeptics the primary thing. Is is usually astrology is just written off as confirmation bias. Um, I think that's more of a danger when it comes to mundane astrology because. Um, when you're dealing with like major outer planet cycles and something that's supposed to be relevant to um, large groups of people, and you're looking at the world in general, there's a lot of variables involved. But that's one of the reasons why I think paying more attention to natal astrology, which is a lot more localized and is actually typically what most astrologers, like I would say 90 to 95% of astrologers actually specialize in. Is just the study of birth charts and looking at the correlations more in the context of an individual person's life. Um, I think the variables are not as big, and sometimes it's easier to see whether this statement that was made ahead of time about the assumption about what's coming up ended up being correct or if it ended up being false. Like sometimes um, skeptics will frame it and say, well, it's so generalized that um, you could apply it to anything or, or something like that. But in fact, while there is a generality about it because it's sometimes phrased or talked about in the sense of of archetypes that astrologers are working with broad archetypes when they talk about the symbolism of certain placements um it's actually specific enough most of the time that i think it's pretty easy to to you know say whether or not the statement or the prediction was true or whether it was false so um i don't think it's just a matter of confirmation bias necessarily even if that's Certainly, like something you have to pay attention to and have to try to avoid um, if you're trying to do this, do astrology seriously and, and consciously and carefully. It, it's um, 
Interesting that you mentioned confirmation bias, because one of the things that we thought about a lot when taking into account natal astrology, and we, we talked a little bit about free will, was um, what we discussed as like the Pygmalion effect, like this idea that if you're told that you're going to be a certain way, like you're more inclined to start like recognizing those traits in yourself and, and like focusing in on them or like honing in on them. And one of the things that I think turned us off about this idea of astrology was like, looking at our signs and some of these characteristics, it's like, well, like, I don't want that characteristic. Like, you know, you want to be the CEO of a company and then your sign is like, eh, you should probably be a janitor. Um, or, you know, like uh, some, I feel like some of the signs are like, you you excel in these areas. And like those areas, uh, you know, especially living in the United States, like some personality traits are more inclined to, uh, you know, succeed more economically. Whereas others, it's like, yeah, like you can be a teacher and make $35,000 a year. So, for us, it was like these feel um, constrictive. Like we feel like we would like be pinned down by our astrological sign, and it feels overly, overly deterministic. And like I'm just like curious as to like what your thoughts are on like on on, on that phenomenon. Sure. I mean, I think um, I think the issue with it being overly restrictive or like like prescriptive, if that's the right way to phrase it, or right. Term I like to that use. word at least. Yeah. 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 No, I I do too. Is um, the issue is that that's more of a danger with the generic pop astrology because it's trying to make specific statements and general statements that are applicable to people that don't have a background in the subject, and so they might be more liable to think that it's more deterministic or more restrictive than it actually is, and that that could be a potential downside to like a popularization of astrology, which is. You know, astrology becomes really popular, and people have this perce- perception that all Scorpios are like this, or all Gemini's are like this. That it could lead to some negative things about people forming preconceptions instead of just getting to know people. Um, but most, once you like get into the astrological community in terms of intermediate and advanced level astrologers, that's not usually how it works, and that's not usually how astrologers approach things. Even though there is. Um, uh, like a, a sort of empiricism of astrologers, you know, taking into account um, the birth charts of people that they knew and what sort of character traits were associated with that or what kind of actions that person had in the past. Usually, astrologers are more careful not to assume immediately that, that the next person they meet that has the exact same placement is going to do that exact same thing. It's just more of a general range of. Um, possible manifestations that are going to range from very constructive ones to very negative ones, but most of the time fall somewhere you know much more in between. So while that's a danger, it's an, it's another one of those things that are like potential downsides, but probably doesn't happen as much as as one might worry that it could, um, especially with maybe proper education on the principles and the ethics of astrology. So like the ethics of astrology is a whole other subfield. Did that answer your question? I feel like there might be another piece there that I didn't get. I guess I'm. I do want to talk about the ethics of astrology, like briefly, because that, that I haven't heard that before, and I'm fascinated by that. But I, I guess, like, just um, more off the cuff than like then, kind of how how does it work? Because I, I, that makes sense about like the pop psychology. Because I mean, it's true uh, pop astrology. Because it's tr- it's true for pop psychology too. You know, like when, right. when someone's like uh, daddy issues is an example of pop psychology, right? And it's like, ah, oh, this is why you act this way because your dad loved baseball. Um, so I'm curious to like, yeah, uh, I guess how would it work then in uh, like from a professional astrologer? And then uh, when you're done with that, I, I probably will follow up with uh, uh, the ethics of astrology because that sounds fascinating. Sure, I, I think it's just that astrologers like actual. Let's say professional astrologers are people that dedicate their lives to studying the subject and trying to figure it out and trying to do their best job, being conscientious about learning how to apply it, um, strive to form a balance between taking into account whatever presuppositions they have based on the astrology when it comes to people in general or making statements or, let's say, interacting with individuals one on one and balancing that with. Um, you know, approaching people as people and putting astrology aside and letting the actions of people inform you about their character and what the nature of your relationship is going to be like with them. And um, finding a balance between those two things, I think, is something that, that most people are actually into astrology strive to do and do a relatively good job of balancing. 
Um, it's just people that are, are new to the subject or have a very shallow understanding that often tend to think that that it should be used to just like categorize or to like reject somebody. Like if somebody's using it for dating or something like that, and was like rejecting somebody because they don't like X sign or something like that. Um, I don't think that's something that you would find most astrologers doing necessarily. I think you you kind of just answered my question about the ethics of it as well. So that that makes a lot of sense. Well, I do have a question about this because I know some people, I know, I personally know people who do make the exact type of assumptions and decisions that you're just mentioning, especially while dating. Uh, I personally know someone who says that they will not date anyone who is not a Sagittarius. And the, and that's the experience that I've personally, as not someone who is deeply involved with the astrology community, I, I see that side more than I see anything else. And then I wonder, like, is... I it's it's hard because I understand that you're saying like, yes, with more education, you can understand to come to this with a more rational and holistic approach. I don't know if that's necessarily the right language, but, you know, a more all-encompassing um, approach to to examining this, this question. But I, I almost wonder, like, it, the pop psychology aspect, it doesn't seem like it's, I'm sorry, the, I'm saying doing the same thing Ian did, the pop yeah. astrology <laughs> aspect of this, like, it's hard to imagine perfectly educating the entire world on appropriate use of astrology. And then I wonder, does astrology then lead itself to this tendency, an increased tendency maybe, to stereotype people? And there's just this, this, this quote that I just keep thinking about, and it's just the an amateur astrologer saying, basically, I don't know you, but I believe something about you based solely mm -hmm. on your sign or something like that. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, part of the issue is that astrology astrology died out in society in like the 17th and 18th centuries and went into a low point from where it was really popular in the renaissance to suddenly um falling out of favor and getting kicked out of academia and no longer being viewed as a legitimate subject for a couple of centuries and then it had this revival in 20, in the 20th century starting especially in the uh 1940s when newspapers and other magazines started running sun sign columns based on the premise that the sign of the zodiac that your sun was located in at the moment of birth had something to say about your character and, and things like that and your future. Um, and that was like a revival of astrology that got more and more popular because it's easy to calculate that. All you need to know is your birth date. You don't have to know your birth time or the birth location or, or where any of the other planets are. You're just looking at one piece of your birth chart. Um, so that's how astrology got repopularized, and that's what most people think astrology is. They tend to think that that's all there is to astrology is just that, and therefore it's easy then to form different um, misconceptions or come to different conclusions about it just based on that, which is something that's common that everybody does, whether they're fans of astrology who are like using it or or misusing it in that way with like dating, for example, by saying they wouldn't date any Sagittarius, or whether it's you know a lot of skeptics that you run into, a lot of the basic skeptic questions that they formulate are based on the premise that sun sign astrology is the entirety of astrology, not being aware that it's it's this much larger field that's more complicated. Um, but the issue is just, you know, the fundamental issue with that is that in the birth chart itself, the sun is just one placement. The sun sign is just one placement, and there's eight or nine or ten, de depending on how you're categorizing it, different planets that could all be in different signs of the zodiac that are going to put an emphasis on different zodiacal signs and different qualities, let's say, at just the most basic level. So it means that the basic premise was kind of mistaken, thinking that any one person is only represented or is even primarily represented by one sign of the zodiac is not a true depiction of astrology. It's just a very partial, incomplete depiction of one small piece of it. Um, so that's one of the reasons why that approach of like excluding all sign, X sign from dating or what have you is a misconception and is taking it in a, in a weird, like inaccurate direction, but it's just based on that lack of familiarity with it. And obviously that's something that comes along with how astrology was repopularized over the past century. And to some extent, that was a necessity for astrology because that's how it came back again and still plays some role in different people's lives. And that often ends up being the entry point where some astrologers occasionally will look into that 
and then they'll find out that there's a moon sign as well, or that there's a Mercury sign, or then they'll discover the concept of natal astrology, and then they'll start looking more into the subject to see what it's actually about. So that's oftentimes sun sign astrology is the entryway into the more advanced forms of astrology for most astrologers. So in that way, it plays some positive role, even though it's also sometimes playing a negative role at the same time. The good news is that over the course of the past 20 years, and especially even the past five years, it seems like there's some astrological concepts that are coming into the public consciousness or becoming popular that are a little bit more advanced. So just in the past five years, it's become more common for people to know not just their sun sign, but also that they have a moon sign and a rising sign. And some of that is happening as a result of both websites that will calculate your birth chart for you for, for free, um, which used to be a thing either that astrologers had to calculate by hand that would take like an hour or two using a bunch of different books and tables and astronomical things, or eventually it was like starting in the 1970s, something you could buy a computerized report that would take like an hour to print out on like an old dot matrix printer. But nowadays, in the past 20 years, suddenly it's something you can get for free, or in the past five years, it's become something where there's popular apps where you can enter your birth data and suddenly you know your sun, moon, and rising right from the start. And that's caused a shift where suddenly the discussions are becoming a little bit more advanced and a little bit more complicated if you're going from one factor of just knowing your sun sign to all of a sudden everybody knows their sun, moon, and rising. You've just tripled your um, data points for what you think astrology is by default and how many signs of the zodiac you think are relevant in terms of composing somebody's personality at a, at a basic level. This is this is one of the things that I've enjoyed about studying astrology for like the past couple of weeks is like these parallels with um like this uh like um triptych in that you find in a lot of psychoanalysis and psychology like this idea of like the ego the super ego and the id and this idea of like um Lacan's uh the the imaginary the real and the symbolic um as we spoke yesterday with uh, our our you know other uh, astrologer friend who talked about like your your sun sign your moon sign and and your earth sign and something along the lines of like how you see yourself and how other people perceive you um and uh it seems to me like there are a lot of parallels between uh psychology and astronomy and uh, uh, one of the answers that we get when we ask people about this is that they're interested in astrology because of psychology so um, I mean, like, what are your thoughts on that? And then, did you ever consider just uh, like why did you pick astrology over psychology um, with this like interest in like you know uh, human behavior and like personality and characteristics? Sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's some that's like a a type of astrology. It's a piece of astrology. Uh, although we have to be careful also because that's another thing where even though most um, Pop astrology is oriented towards character analysis or broadly by extension psychology or psychological analysis. Not all astrology or not all astrologers focus on character analysis or psychological analysis. There's other astrologers, like for example, I mentioned Richard Tarnas, who did that study Cosmos and Psyche, where he was looking at outer planet cycles and how that's um, matched up with like shifts in world history at different points. That's a separate branch called mundane astrology, which really isn't primarily psychological in its motivations. So I just wanted to clarify that, that not all astrologers are necessarily drawn to it due to psychology or choose to use it for psychological purposes, even though in 20th century astrology that was the main focus. And when astrology was revived in the 20th century, it was revived around the same time that depth psychology was getting going. And so astrologers have tended to use it much more for character analysis and psychological analysis in modern times, but in ancient times it was more predictive, even though that was a piece of it. Um, but one of your questions that ties into that that's worth answering now was, you know, why not just why do we have to ask and why not just focus solely on psychology and get to right to the heart of it? And I guess part of the answer to that question is, you know, imagine sitting down with like a psychologist or psychoanalyst that you're going to talk with and try to work through some issues or they're going to try to get to know you and form some sort of assessment or psychological profile of you and you're going to attempt to work with them and the psychologist is going to attempt to work with you to understand 
let's say, some of your background and what some of your core issues are that you struggle with as a person and how that's affecting you, how that what happened earlier in your life and how that's affecting you now as an adult and what ongoing patterns and things um, you're trying to work out. So that's something when they start from ground one, they they have nothing. They they work from scratch, being completely in the dark about who you are as a person, and then they build up to the best of their ability. Let's say in a one hour session every week or every other week, you know, some idea of who you are as a person. But what if that psychologist did have any sort of let's say not cheat sheet, but let's say shortcut to understanding some of even if it was only like a small percentage of like your psychological complexes or some of the core factors that are still playing an important role that are reoccurring themes in your life as a person from a psychological standpoint, you know, would that be useful to you as a psychologist? And would you use that or take it into account? And I think the appeal of something like that, assuming it's correct or assuming it does have any legitimacy whatsoever, the appeal of that I think would be clear. So I guess following up on the on this idea of just having extra information to help make an analysis, what about mm. other forms? And 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 maybe this is just totally and like out of the out of the same field of conversation or the same topic. But like, what about alternative? Um, alternative belief systems, alternative practices that deal with similar issues. Like I'm thinking primarily of tarot because I've, I've seen a lot of, um, and just looking recently, just a lot of correlations between uh, astrologers will also be tarot, I don't know what you call those people, tarot people. Tarot readers, I think. Tarot, tarot yeah. readers. And then, uh, and then also what about like psychics and palmistry and witchcraft? Do all of these various fields that like, they seem like overlapping in the Venn diagram of I'm not even sure what to call. I don't. I don't want to say mysticism because I'm not sure if that's offensive. Um, I, I guess apparently is that offensive to say mysticism? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, maybe for some people, but not necessarily. There's probably a better phrase, which is, I don't know. Let's say like alternative spirituality or um, the New Age movement or something like that. Although not all of that falls into the New Age. Sure. Okay. Well, then using one of those frameworks, what about tarot and psychics and palmistry? Are these beliefs, I guess, primarily that that you think that you have personally, or and do you think that those are compatible with astrology generally? Yeah. So I, I think astrology is its own thing and is its own unique thing that does sometimes overlap or has interactions with other fields. One of the issues is that in the early 20th century, in like the 1900s, when astrology was revived. It was partially revived within the context of the the growing New Age movement and an interest in alternative philosophies and spiritualities and um, the Theosophical Society and things like that. So, when astrology was revived, it sort of was revived at the same time under the banner of interest in a bunch of um, different alternative spiritualities and things like that. Uh, so that that's had an impact in terms of then those things being grouped together with astrology or often going hand in hand, even if they weren't always like that in history and even if they aren't necessarily intimately interlinked, you know, that you have to accept one in order to accept the other. That's not necessarily true. There's astrologers that just do astrology and they don't do any of that other stuff or have any of those other beliefs. Um, you know, there's astrologers who are just like a straight Muslim astrologer. There's some astrologers that focus on astrology from a statistical standpoint, like Michelle Gochlin in the mid 20th century, who ran statistical tests of astrology. There's some astrologers that just focus on the history of astrology or what have you. So there's many different approaches, and it's not a given, even though there is overlap, it's just partially due to the cultural context in which astrology was revived over the past century. Mm. So yeah. that being said, um, to the extent that if astrology is a form of divination and many astrologers view it as a form of divination, to the extent that it's true, it can open you up to, like, if astrology works, then maybe some of these other forms of divination might be, might work as well or might be relevant. So if it, um, it's one of those things where sometimes if something like symbolic thinking or symbolic correlations between planets and earthly events, if that can work, then some people then extend that to say that other forms of divination are based on a similar premise, that 
you shuffle the cards and you pull out X tarot card, which is half supposed to have X symbolic meaning, and that meaning actually happens to coincide with this issue that you were thinking about at that moment in time and describes it pretty well and tells you something about the future. Um, so my background isn't in tarot, so I'm not explaining that very well, and that's not something I've ever done much with, but I at least see that um, sometimes astrology can open people up to looking into other things like that because it removes some preconceptions about what, what works or what doesn't work. Um, but it gets really tricky when it comes to things like psychics or tarot cards or other things like that, because one of the issues about astrology that keeps it grounded and makes it unique compared to other forms of divination is that the alignments of the planets, the movements of the planets is something that's external and is predictable and is true no matter what and will be true today just as it was 2,000 years ago, just as you can predict where the planets will be 2,000 years from now. So there's this objective component to it that exists out there independent of anything else, and that's not always true of other forms of divination or, or things like that. So it puts astrology in a weird, unique um, category, even if it's partially based on divination. In addition to the fact that there is some causal physical mechanism underlying some astronomical things, even though I don't think astrology can primarily be explained through even some sort of unknown causal mechanism. But like, for example, the seasons and the movement of the sun and the effect that that has on the growth of plants and plant life or the different seasons and the length of daytime and daylight that's available during different parts of the year and things like that. So astrology has this weird thing where there are some like causal factors that are relevant as well, which is not true in other forms of divination like tarot. Yeah. How uh, this is kind of really just like a, a point blank question, but like how do you think astrology can help people? I feel like it means something different a little bit to like everybody that that uh, practices it or, or, or you know uh, uh, has an interest in it. And this is just something I'm curious to hear from an astrologer. The way I might ask like a, a writer how literature helps people. Yeah, um, there's many different answers to that. I mean, one that I've thought of for many years. And I sometimes times have debates about with my girlfriend, but it with my partner, but it um, relates to part of your your backgrounds, but one of the things I think could be a conclusion from it that might be helpful or relevant is um, that if the premise of astrology is true, and especially the premise of natal astrology is true, that the alignment of the planets at the moment that a person is born has something to say about their, their future and the nature and the course of their life, it does a it does imply that some things are a little bit more planned out, or there might be some sort of background like code or matrix or however you want to explain it that's running in the background um, that sets up a, a sort of meaningful sequence of events in a person's life. And to whatever extent that's true, if it was true, it could imply that um, some of the events that take place in our lives are more meaningful and deliberate and purposeful than we would otherwise have any normal reason to think. Um, it could be indicating some sort of broader sense of meaning and purpose to our lives, and that would be essentially what fate is. And that's how ancient um, some of the ancient philosophers, like the Stoics, described fate as a meaningful ordering of events in accordance with some sort of plan or some sort of rationale. So in trying to think about what the underlying significance of astrology would be if it was true, one of the ways that I've tried to formulate that is just that if astrology was true to any extent, then it could imply that um, what's happening in the cosmos and the events that happen in our world could be a little bit more meaningful rather than the alternative alternative option, which is the typical like prevailing one at this point in time, which is just that you know events in the world are, are meaningless. We're just like um, specks of um, you know organic matter that's floating around on a rock in the middle of the universe that came about as a result of nothing. And the only meaning that any of our lives has is the subjective meaning that we give to it. But otherwise, there is no objective sort of like meaning or purpose or 
reason for any of the things that happen in any of our lives. It's all just kind of random, which is like a fine position and normally would be my default position. Um, but there, there could be something about astrology that could point to something else going on in the universe, and that could be one of the greatest um, philosophical or, or scientific or other things that could be relevant about astrology in some deeper, deeper way. So it's a, it's a meaning making field of expression and study, and is, is what I'm hearing that it's helpful by giving you a sense of meaning if maybe you're struggling. Is that maybe an appropriate way to summarize that? Yeah, I think that's one of the ways that it could be useful or helpful is it could um, show that there could be some meaning underlying events in a person's life sometimes. And um, something like that for some people could be felt as like reassuring or helpful or good to know versus, you know, there's an alternative option, which is our alternative interpretation, which is that some people could find that that's not you know good to know they might not want to to think about the idea that some events in their life could be like predetermined or foreordained or what have you that could feel constraining and could feel the opposite i guess it's just a matter of like what events we're talking about and what perspective you're looking at it from right well it's interesting too because when we did uh we did a camp on um an immersion into demon summoning and we spoke with some of the uh, high priestess and basically, and I, you know, I imagine maybe some of your listeners are already rolling their eyes. They're like, "That's not real," you know, whatever. Well, we're trying here. <laughs> um, but what, um, what, what? Basically, what she had told us was that uh, we're effectively probably too closed off to uh, to feel the spiritual demonic forces at play. And I'm wondering if something similar might exist in astrology. My guess is no, but I, I'm just curious, like. Even if not believing in astrology, like is there are there benefits being does like I guess I guess are the astrono astrological forces working on us even if we are closed off from it from like a belief side from a belief perspective? Um, yeah, I mean, I would I would say as an astrologer that whether you guys ever look at your birth chart or not, um, or look at your transits for different times in your life and what that would indicate about what types of events might be taking place that that will be happening and like working out there sort of like the the background behind let's say like a mechanical clock and even if you only ever look at the face of that clock and only see the um you know the two hands that tell you what time it is there's still gears like you know 100 gears working behind that that are um lining those things up whether you're paying attention to the background stuff or not so um, yeah, it, it can work even independently of people paying attention to it. I think I, I feel love like some that of the metaphor of the clock. That's so nice, especially thinking of like orbitals and stuff like that. You're thinking about like rotations and planets. It's it's really interesting um, to think about just paying attention, whether or not you pay attention to it, one way or the other. The the clock still ticks. I think that resonates with me. Yeah, well, and it's it's something because I you know I often try to think of what a metaphor is for astrology, and even though it gets cliche, there's metaphors like that that are probably relevant about what it actually probably is. If it's true that it works, that it's something like that, like a clock that's working in the background, but it's more complicated than that because you know, like a better modern analogy is like it would be not to get too out there but it sounds like uh like, like like the matrix or something like that where if you could see the code behind reality that was showing you all of like the bits and pieces that were describing what's happening at that time that's kind of what astrology is in in a way um and and if astrology was ever validated in any way that's probably the closest analogy i can come up with to what what it probably is on some level sometimes when like I think about the language used to describe, uh, I guess, how astrology is thinking about like the planets and, and the universe and the solar system and, and everything that's happening. Like the, there seems to be sometimes like an, a personification or like uh, anthropor uh, anthropomorphizing, uh, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I know what I'm trying to say. Um, and it, it, I always end up thinking of astrology uh, like religiously, and uh, I, I can't help but wonder if, like, dis if astrology provides moral guidance in the same way a, a religion might. Moral guidance, um, like, could you give an example? Well, I mean, you know, like, I guess I'm, you know, as Shay said, I'm not much of a, a religious person, but you know, there's, there's, um. 
plenty of uh, tenets like Christianity, like you know, love love thy neighbor. Um, uh, there's more. I know there's more. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, don't, I don't know them off yeah. the top of my head, but yeah, I mean, like the, it, it, there there are certainly like uh, tenets, rules, guidance uh, provided by Christianity, uh, Judaism, Islam, um, Buddhism, and I'm wondering if uh, there's something similar in in astrology. Right. I'm trying to think if there is. I mean, the problem is that the like astrology itself is very neutral. It's just like there's planets, they're happening out there, and they're correlating with stuff. I mean, I do know there's another level, and that's really it, like full stop. That's that's kind of it. Um, it's just this thing that's happening out there in nature. It's some sort of property of nature that's happening that doesn't require awareness of it, but it seems to be operating sort of below reality. Um, there are astrologers that sometimes try to develop like ethical codes or uh, codes of ethics, or um, try to draw conclusions from it. Like, um, but that usually involves incorporating other religious or philosophical things that they put on top of it, such as ideas of like karma and, and reincarnation and other stuff like that. But those are usually things that are um, either they're trying to draw conclusions from the astrology themselves, which may or may not be accepted by all astrologers, or they're trying to import other pre-existing philosophical and religious precepts that they, they want to use in tandem with the, the astrology. But I'm not sure that that's necessarily something that's inherently being derived from the astrology itself. I am relieved by the use of that phrase as, as of it being neutral because I do know that like while I was doing research, I think I, I encountered I can't remember her name, but a, a relatively popular serial um, astrologist, and uh, she was you know gushing about how the universe is on your side, and you know in terms of my skepticism, I was like mm, I I I don't know. Um, but sure. I, I, yeah, I, I do know that appeals to like a certain audience. And like one of the statistics that we kept running into when we were doing our research is that women are apparently more likely than men to subscribe to astrology. And I'm, we're just wondering like why you think that might be the, uh, might be the case. Yeah, I can't tell how much of that is something that's um, natural or inherent to astrology, or if it's only a result of um, just the cultural context of astrology and its revival over the past century and, and the, the way in which it was revived, um, as well as the way in which it was often marketed to women through like, you know, fashion magazines that still carry like horoscope columns or what was it? It's like a Vogue or or um Cosmopolitan. Big, Cosmo, yeah, has a has yeah. a they've they've always had a section, but they recently even expanded their section. And there's no like similar parallel Section in like whatever I don't know what's a men's magazine like Playboy or something like that. Like they don't they don't have like a horoscope yeah. um, column that tells you from the guy's perspective. So, but I don't know how much that's because women are naturally in some way more you know a skeptic would say susceptible to astrology or a non skeptic let's say an enthusiast might say that women are more. Intuitive or something like that. I don't know if, if any of those arguments are true or if it's just a a side effect of of our culture over the past century and something about the revival of astrology and its orientation towards character analysis and psychology uh, in the past few decades. Because one of the funny things about that is that if you go back prior to the last century or two, all the astrologers in history were men, so um, women were not usually given the same education. And didn't have the same even ability to study astrology at all times, which astrology, you have to remember, prior to modern times, was something that required um, advanced mathematical and astronomical training in order to do the calculations necessary in order to calculate birth charts. And so, if you go back in history, there's actually a lot of famous scientists and astronomers um, like Johannes Kepler or Claudius Ptolemy, who were also astrologers. Because you had to be pretty good at astronomy in order to calculate the the stuff necessary. So it's like prior to the past few centuries, when I wrote my book on Hellenistic astrology, um, I tried to find who was the first woman that we know of that was a practicing astrologer. And it took until, even though astrology goes back to like 2000, 3000 BCE, the first one I was able to find wasn't until like the fifth century. And it was like a maybe for Hypatia, who um, was like the daughter of a famous astronomer at the time named Theon of Alexandria, 
and she ended up being killed by like a Christian mob who was riled up partially under the premise that she was doing weird stuff with astrolabes and um, something else like demon stuff because that was at the point where Christianity was really on the rise. So, and then it, the next one I was able to find wasn't until the ninth century, and it was a a princess or a um, the wife of a king at the time in the Middle East, and her name was Baran of Baghdad, and she was said to have there's like a legend about her thwarting a um, assassination attempt on the king through astrological means, which may or may not be correct, but just to give you an example, so just historically, astrology tended to be thing something that was done by men, as far as we know, due to the educational restrictions on women through most of history. So that it's switched primarily to women at this point as consumers is an interesting then reversal of what it may have been up to this point. It is really interesting because when I even think about my first exposure to astrology, I think of being in middle school or high school and having my female friends come up to me and like we, we would the conversation would start normally that way. And that's probably because of what you're talking about, the Cosmo magazines or, you know, where it was marketed then. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because I was thinking about it while you're talking. about it. It's, it does seem that like the historical trend seems to be that astrology required a great deal of education in, in its, you know, I mean, just historically throughout until the modern era. Um, you know, and it was so tied to science and math, something that you know a lot of women didn't have the same a access to that we have now. So I don't know. It, it, I'm wondering if I'm wondering if like, it's decline. I'm struggling still to see where where the switch happens there. Like why it is that women now are are such are such consumers of astrology, and it's weird to use a, like a, a capitalism term to talk about this. It really feels uh, incongruous, but. Um, I don't know. There's something about it, and there's. I think there has to be, and I'm still like working these ideas out. There, I feel like there has to be something about toxic masculinity in there because, like, I, it never felt sure. f like it was for me. Um, you know, like it never felt like I was. I mean, I think I was always invited, but I was. It was like an invitation that would be met with like some ridicule. You know. Sure. I mean, there there may be something to. It's like all of that being said. There may be something to. I, I don't know because I, I don't want to get into some. You start. I try to do an episode about this, but sometimes it starts trend, uh, treading on issues with like modern gender distinctions and discussion about men and women sure. and different things like that. But there could yeah. be some, let's say, one of the the things that's put forward is like maybe women are more um, predisposed towards being more introspective or more inherently interested in examining um, their emotional state and how that's affecting things or something like that. And so maybe the fact that modern astrology, when it was reconstituted, was not something that was about like hardcore prediction, but the fact that sun sign astrology and pop astrology was more about character analysis and psychology, maybe that that is something that appealed more to women than it did to men. And sometimes in the astrological community itself, once you get past pop astrology, um, you know, sometimes there can be a tendency for um Men to get into it and be very interested in like hardcore predictive astrology and the idea that you can predict the future or control your fate or something like that, so that they're trying to be more do something with it that's that's more um, concrete and and less like self reflective in some way. Mm. I, don't, I don't know if that's actually accurate, so I don't want to push that too far. But I'm just saying maybe it has something to do with different dynamics like that if they exist between men and women. Um, I don't know, and I don't want to say for sure because I'm not trying to get in trouble and start major <laughs> debate here. But um, you. you know, who knows? Yeah, this is this is something we're not totally sure how to talk about either. But it is interesting, and we are curious about it. And I, I mean, speaking of um, trying to do something concrete with it, one of the things that we read that was really alar like I, I don't know, alarming, shocking, interesting was that uh, Nancy Reagan apparently famously consulted an astrologer to help determine like. Reagan's presidency toward the end of his second term. And um, if we think about astrology, what you would call, I'm sorry, uh, not banal astrology. Mundane. Uh, mundane astrology. Okay, I was like, or that's not right. Electional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we think about yeah. astrology in terms of, um, y you know, helping determine the future or like, as you're saying, um, do you think astrology should have like a, play a role in politics? Like should uh, politicians, um, you know, uh, astrological signs or like their their natal their natal charts uh, matter. Like, what are your thoughts on that? 
Um, yeah, well, let's start with one of the things this is the way you guys had formulated that question I thought was really interesting in the notes because it was interesting in revealing part of the public um, sentiment towards it and how um, a piece of like 1980s spin, political spin of the damage control when that story came out that Nancy and that the Reagans were using astrology in the White House, part of the, um, the damage control that they came up with at the time when this story broke in like the 1980s because a disgruntled former White House chief of staff wrote a tell-all book about it is the Reagan White House's response was that this was just Nancy that was into it. And it was Reagan's wife and it was part of her female like failings after the assassination attempt that happened on him that she turned to astrology as a crutch. Uh, because she was so worried about his life, and that was when um, he just sort of got dragged unwillingly into it. And the funny point about that, when I researched this for a while, actually, for episode 68 of my podcast, which I did on this, was they actually had a history of using astrology going back many years, all the way back into like the 1960s, and had been documented doing things at weird times, like having him inaugurated at like midnight or close to midnight or something, and all the reporters at the time were wondering why he's doing something this public at such a weird hour of night. Mm. Um, and they has a, he had a consistent history of, of doing that. And then this astrologer actually came out and wrote a book about it because she was kind of annoyed that they were downplaying her work. And she said that she had actually been working with them uh, this one astrologer going back to the very beginning of their campaign, and that she was sort of behind the scenes picking out times for them to launch his presidential campaigns, for him to sign major treaties like a nuclear treaty with Russia, um, for debates between Reagan and Jimmy Carter, that she picked out a debate, a date that she thought would be better for Reagan and not as good for Carter to help him win the debate. So, um, I just thought it was interesting because the way what the public actually thinks about that is partially based on the spin and the damage control that the they came up with in the late 1980s in order to blame it on like Nancy being a fr being like a woman basically and it being part of her shortcoming when in fact it was probably something that they were both using together for many many years up to that point. That's really interesting, and I, I, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, it's weird too because if we think about like the collateral damage that happened because of like Reagan's pre presidency and his like policies, like, right, you know, maybe the damage control is better than like actually being like, wait a minute, like who made this decision? Like, how did? Why did they handle you know like the AIDS crisis this way? Um, yeah, but and that's something when I talk about Reagan that I, will, I'm always trying to be quick not to endorse, because I don't necessarily endorse his politics, but just setting the record straight about the extent mm. to which astrology was involved. And also, interestingly, because astrology is also something that tends to be more associated with the left um, and with like the, the New Age and, and alternative medicine or different things like that, but there is this stream sometimes that shows up most prominently with Reagan, so that it's something that's not necessarily tied to any one political group or anything like that. Mm. Um, anyways, but to, to your point, though, yeah, I mean, that is a potential problem. And what's one of the interesting things is even his inauguration, his the other day I, I tweeted when everybody we were trying to get the inauguration time for the exact moment that Biden and Harris um, took their oaths. And um, during Reagan's second inauguration, the astrologer Joan Quigley, she had him do it a few minutes early because she wanted to put this auspicious Moon Jupiter conjunction directly on. In the middle of the sky, or in the most prominent place in the chart possible, and so if you look at his inauguration, he did it just a little bit earlier before noon than he was supposed to, just in order to accomplish that. And it is weird reading his biography how they called him, you know, the Teflon president because nothing would stick to him, and he never went down for any of the major stuff that some of his subordinates did, like the Iran Contra scandal. Um, which he, you know, honestly should have gone down for, but for some reason he didn't. And one wonders. I mean, if somebody could make that argument, maybe it was because of all of these extra things that he was doing with the astrologer. Who knows? On the positive side, I do want to say, you know, signing that major um, intercontinental ballistic missile treaty with Russia, and the fact that the astrologer did help to pick a auspicious chart for it to ensure its success, could have been on, you know 
you know, positive factor that could have helped or to whatever extent that did help to become a successful treaty um, could have been a positive thing. So I don't know. You, you could make positive or negative arguments either way in terms of Reagan's pre- presidency and its effect um, politically and the role that astrology then by extension is something that was positive or negative in terms of helping him or 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 not. That is, I mean, that is super fascinating. That's way more interesting than than uh, what what we read. So thank you for setting the record straight on that because that is like way juicier. Um, yeah, I mean, but check I guess out, I, check out episode sixty eight of the podcast just because I did a full in depth deep dive like two hour thing into that based on a lot of like a few years of research and always wished that it got viewed by more people because it's a lot more interesting than it sounds like it should be at first first glance. Mm. I'm like already like, okay, yeah, yeah I, w- I want to hear that. But I guess, yeah, so I, I mean, kind of just taking it back to the question, like then based on, I guess, the success of Reagan's presidency, do you, it sounds like you're under the, pre- under the uh, belief, and maybe I'm making an assumption that like astrology should have a role in politics. Like, do you feel that way or no? No, not actually. I, I did a blog for a few years called the Political Astrology Blog from 2000. Nine through 2013, during the first part of Obama's presidency, where we um, followed politics and we collected birth times for candidates and made predictions about the outcome of the 2012 presidential election, different things like that, and checked in with past predictions that we had made to follow up on our success or failures. And that was fun. But once I started getting the more I got into it the more and the more I researched the history of astrology the more nervous I got about astrologers um getting into politics on that level because oftentimes when astrologers get involved in politics at different points in history that's when the bans on astrology start happening and that's when astrologers start getting themselves in trouble because um sometimes that's what leads to astrology getting suppressed and for me um, making predictions and being right, or sort of like showing off astrology and, and demonstrating that it's a real thing by making successful predictions was not as important to me as um, just doing astrology because it's an inherently interesting thing in, in and of itself. So I, I went ahead and I closed down that political astrology blog in 2013 after that election because I didn't want to to keep heading in that direction. I thought it would actually be potentially dangerous for astrologers to become more prominent in that way in the future because I could see that politics was getting worse and worse, and I was worried about um, astrologers getting caught up in that. So I guess following this line of thinking then, can astrology then be used for evil or for like wrongdoing then? Like can you can can you be nefariously predicting on behalf of people who I guess are bad for lack of a, a more nuanced and elegant term. Um, yeah, I mean potentially. I mean that's one of the the potential downsides of it just being this neutral like technology is like any technology. It could be used for good or for bad. It really just depends on who's using it. I mean, you know, Reagan, depending on your political affiliations and what you feel about his presidency, is a great example of that in terms of was that a good thing? Was he using that for good, or was the astrologer? Who was trying to help him? Was that counterproductive for the country as a whole? Uh, you know that 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 comes down to one's politics, but definitely you could use it for bad things because it's kind of a neutral thing in and of itself. Uh, it could go either way. It entirely depends on the person who's wielding it and who's using it. And you know they could try to. I should also add that they could try to use it for bad things and still fail or still not be successful or. Alternatively, they could try to use it for good things but still fail or still be not successful. One of the issues with astrology is um, sometimes there's there's an issue about like how much control or how much power does it, if it does work, would it actually even give you effectively or how much of an advantage does it actually give you versus how much is it just describing things that are going to happen anyways. Um, that mm. it's not necessarily going to alter, alter the outcome of. That's interesting. So, so even making the predictions might not make any difference because it's basically like saying the sun will set tomorrow. There's nothing you can do about it. The sun will still set. So, I guess maybe having the the foresight of an event is is uh, advantageous to some, but might yeah, not I, alter the course of of anything. 
Yeah, I mean, it really just depends. It comes down to fate or free will issue, and and it's really hard to answer that question whether things are fully predetermined or whether they're they're only partially predetermined and there's some wiggle room or what the actual um, yeah, what the case is with that. And it's really hard to hard to say sometimes. Right. It's interesting that you mentioned the thing about the persecution because when we were kind of researching, um, like again, I don't want to necessarily use the term mysticism, but she wasn't an astrologer; she was a, a shaman. Uh, the South Korean president Park Geun Hye, um, when she uh, she was found out to be consulting with a shaman and for like political advice, and when they found this out, they impeached her and they she's in prison now. Oh, wow. um, yeah, I didn't so know. It's, what, of uh, what country? South Korea. Um, I was there. I was there oh, when they right. impeached her. Yeah, yeah. That was like a weird because it wasn't a part of like a cult or something like that. Or in Korea, they call it Saibi, which is basically like a, a, a pseudo religion. Uh, it's basically just like an offshoot of some religious tenet, and it's like okay, like we believe some of these fundamental things, but we believe them this way. And um, okay. it's it's yeah, that's like a whole. That's like a whole thing because I guess like her father, uh, or the shaman's father was the original um, like uh, consultant, mystical consultant for her, uh, while her father was alive and like a dictator. So it's like it's it's a whole crazy thing. Okay. Um, but yeah, but, yeah. There's so, the whole history of astrology and politics and astrologers either being on the inside with polit- certain politicians or rulers. Is, has a whole history, and then astrology be on the outside. I mean, the inside is like there's famous astrologers like um, type like uh, Thrasyllus in the first century, who was the personal astrologer to the emperor Tiberius, like the second emperor of the Roman Empire, um, and major instances like that, or other later ones with like medieval astrologers serving kings or other things like that. There's also downside ones where, for example. Um, the the Nazis uh, in the 1940s outlawed astrology and outlawed the printing of astrology books and rounded up a bunch of astrologers and threw them in concentration camps where some of them died. So sometimes the attempts to control or suppress astrology as a form of information that that people want to control is a is another strong pull. It's really wow. interesting. Well, I guess yeah. I guess we're kind of coming to the end of our, our questions and stuff. Um, and uh, uh, this has been super enlightening and, and uh, fun for me. But I guess like you know, the, I, I guess the verdict still stands that like you know Shay and I as uh, I don't know. I guess like just the kind of stubborn you know bullheaded uh, mules that we are. Like um, I, I think we still hold on to like some skepticism. So it's like what what is something that like you say to skeptics or people who are skeptical and like don't believe in astrology or do you, do you just like you know what you do you i'm going to do me you know i don't have time for this like what's your approach to that yeah i mean i used to be more caught up in in that or trying to debate people that were overtly anti astrology which is kind of kind of a difference like sometimes i feel like if i run into there's a difference between running into somebody that's um Makes it their life's work or part of their profession is disproving things. They get a certain amount of um, investment in, in needing to be on that side of things um, if they're part of the sort of modern skeptical movement, which I think is different than having a sort of healthy dose of skepticism that is trending more towards neutrality or just not knowing or that sounding weird and that not sounding like something that should be true. Um, and at this point, I, I would not blame you for for not thinking it's necessarily a legitimate phenomenon, or or having no idea if any of the stuff that I'm saying is true or has it has any validity. Um, but what I usually would recommend, and I've always tried to think about what would be the most impressive thing. What what should people look into if they want to see if astrology is a valid phenomenon for themselves? And for me, the primary thing is just the study of your own birth chart, especially if you have. An accurate recorded birth time, um, then it should be a twofold approach of, on the one hand, looking at your birth chart itself and seeing if it is true that it describes you or your life or the events of your life in any way, because it shouldn't. It's it's all it is. All the birth chart is is it's just a a diagram that depicts a two dimensional diagram that depicts where the planets were located um, at the moment that you were born. And I think we can all agree that where the planets were located at the moment of your birth should have no bearing on, you know, the day that you end up getting married or when you 
become successful in your job or when you get fired from something or something like that. It should have absolutely no relation. So just looking at the birth chart itself and seeing if it has actually anything true to say that's not a reach and is not simply a matter of confirmation bias about your life or your personality or other things like that. And then secondarily, um, using the birth chart and applying some of the basic timing techniques to it. Um, chiefly, one of the most important timing techniques is known as transits, which is just that you take the birth chart, which is where the planets were at the moment you were born, and then you compare later events in your life and you see where the planets were um, when major events happened. And if the planets lined up with placements in your birth chart in uh, symbolically significant ways, and if they do, then that actually kind of um, confirms the premise of astrology to some extent. Whereas if you don't see a consistent correlation and it doesn't seem to line up very well, then um, that would mean that you're not seeing it and it's not really something that is valid then um, based on your personal experience. And to me, like I always wish more people would do that kind of experiment to see if it actually does have anything to say that looks valid about their life. Um, because I think if you do that honestly, then sometimes it's hard not to see some of those correlations and think that there's something going on there. And that's always been the thing that keeps me coming back to it after 20 years of looking into it myself. That's so interesting. You know, hearing you say this and like considering myself still, you know, somewhat of a skeptic, I I have to say that you've definitely, at least in this conversation, given me a broader framework, certainly a, a broader understanding of astrology generally but uh, i mean i've uh ian ian's probably heard so much of this but i've been learning so much about um uh like i don't know uh i don't i don't know how to say it without sounding really nerdy but like um quantum mechanics and like gravity and stuff like that i've just been nerding out like a lot on my on my uh, my own time and i thought that there might be some at first i thought okay astrology might be related to some of these like cosmological ideas of just like you know grand physics and then i was like well you know what i don't really think so i feel like it's more related to like our solar system's astronomy which i think is still like primarily true for the most part from what i understand but now th this this new metaphor of like the matrix or like the clockwork underneath reality reminds me a lot of what I hear. And I, and I have to be careful when I say this because I know that a lot of people have used like the idea of like quantum mechanics and with with little understanding and have misstated it and in in, in a new agey way to like imply things that it, quantum mechanics doesn't say. But my limited knowledge of quantum mechanics partnered with my limited understanding now of astrology is painting at least somewhat more of a colorful image that seems a little bit more real to me. I'm still I still consider myself a skeptic, but I do have to say that my opinion of it has has shifted in this conversation, which is actually it feels um it feels interesting and it feels good. I actually enjoy that aspect of it. And I'm not just trying to toot your toot your horn. Sure. I don't want it to come across as like that yeah. kind of thing. But it's an interesting conversation for me. It really has been. Yeah. yeah uh, good. I mean, yeah. I, and I, even though I have more of a sign or omen based conceptualization of astrology, and I think that's primarily how it works. I'm hesitant to completely rule out some sort of causal explanation that could be related to quantum me mechanics or something. I don't know. Um, but that's usually the point where people don't pass further is they say there's no causal explanation for that or way that that could be true. Therefore, this subject can't be true. Therefore, there's no reason to look into it further. And I think that's the stopping point for most people. But that's why I wanted to try to explain some of that because that may not need to be the stopping point and it might be worth looking into even if we don't fully understand precisely the mechanism underlying it and that the mechanism itself may be different than what we're usually conceptualized to thinking You know, all things work as a result of. Um, but for me, I've wanted to try to explain it in this way or figure out how to explain it to somebody that is skeptical because periodically in the history of astrology, sometimes there's somebody who's really smart, who's like a polymath that tries to tie it all together and make it make sense in terms of modern cosmology and modern physics and philosophy and everything else. So like Claudius Ptolemy attempted to do that in the second century, for example. Um, but we don't really have that yet today in astrology. And I um I'm really good with the history and I, I try to think deeply about things like the philosophy to come to 
answers about some of this, but I'm not equipped to answer some of those broader things or figure it out, and I don't think I'm the one to do that. But I hope at least at some point maybe there will be somebody that has some of that background that comes in and is able to figure some of these things out and create the sort of like grand unified field theory that we're kind of missing and would be necessary to place astrology on a more solid footing um, from a scientific and philosophical perspective in modern times. So, you know, we'll see what happens. And in the meantime, I'm going to keep trying to refine, you know, figuring out how to explain it to people as best that I can in a way that's, um, a, you know, appealing or applicable or appropriate for all astrologers and all the different traditions and approaches that are involved. But I appreciate you guys for giving me this opportunity to try to have this conversation today because it was a good, um, good, uh, exercise in attempting to do that. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we uh, appreciate you taking the time to like, you know, uh, explain it to us and and uh, let us ask you all these questions. I know it was yeah. a lot. So thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you yeah, so no, much. No problem. Is there anything else that we didn't touch on or any lingering questions that you have um, or things that we only touched on briefly that you wanted to go back to um, just to make oh. sure we've covered everything? Well, you know, there's one little thing that I noticed in your speaking, and maybe I was just looking too deeply into this. But you said, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you said a few times, you said like, if astrology is true, and you use this kind of this 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 framework of just of not saying emphatically that it is. And I'm just curious, like, do you believe emphatically? Yes, this is absolutely true. This is like the foundation of our understanding and interpretation of the universe. Um. Yeah, I wouldn't. Uh do it and I wouldn't keep doing it. I would have stopped at some point <laughs> uh, if I didn't think it was true. Well, it's worth it's worth saying because that's again, it's one of the problems. It's one of the reasons why I was I was open to having this conversation with you guys, but I was hesitant to use the term skeptic because one of the core skeptical assumptions that most professional skeptics have is that astrologers that that astrology can't be true and astrologers must know that it's not true, and therefore they're just attempting to defraud people when they say that they're using astrology to do various things. So it creates this weird situation where they're they're working assumption, not interact having interacted with many astrologers or done much in the astrological community or anything else. They're working assumption as outsiders is that astrologers are deliberately just trying to rip people off and don't think that it's actually a legitimate phenomenon. And that's one of the most, the biggest objections that I have to most skeptical critiques or treatments of astrology is it just takes like five minutes of being in the astrological community to realize that 98 or 99% of the people within it think this, that this is a legitimate phenomenon. And then they're applying it to their life themselves on a regular basis so that right away you can tell that, that if that skeptical critique is being leveled at most astrologers as a generality, it's not true, and it immediately gives away that this person isn't very familiar with the practitioners of the subjects that they're talking about. Um, but you guys approached this in a much different way, and that's one of the reasons why I wasn't sure if if calling this like a discussion with skeptics was right because mm. approaching it with some of those assumptions is much different. Mm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I do I do believe it's a legitimate thing, but I also. You know, I try to pay attention to. I originally got into astrology partially through um, what you might call like some conspiracy theories and some new age stuff. And over a period of a few years, I um, got more and more into astrology, and I decided to go into and study it in college, especially with the context of the history of astrology, right out of high school. And um, over time, as I got older, like some of the conspiracy theory stuff, I grew out of, and I realized was false or based on misinformation or other things like that like stuff maybe com comparable to like the QAnon stuff even um but for some reason the astrology I would periodically check in with myself and say is this that or is this a legitimate phenomenon and always try to keep myself as grounded as possible in continually asking myself that question like I am am I one of those people that is just so dragged into a conspiracy theory or a religion or a cult or something like that that I can't see through my own confirmation bias or other things like that? Or is this actually a legitimate phenomenon that's happening for some reason, even though 
from a completely rational and objective standpoint, like we all know that it probably shouldn't, but for some reason, you know, is it? Um, and you know, it's been 20, 21 years now, and I, I still keep coming back to, despite checking in with myself, thinking that there is something to it and that this is actually a legitimate phenomenon that's happening. And therefore, my goal is to try to explore it and understand it as best that I can. But I try to stay grounded also partially because I'm always very aware of what it must look like to somebody from the outside. And it makes me cringe to think of like, you know, so many people I probably grew up with in high school or other things like that who just think, you know, that I've probably lost it or that I'm into this really lame thing if I've dedicated my entire career to studying sun signs or whatever their basic misconception is of what I do. Um, so learning how to explain it to people that don't have any background in it has been part of my goal in terms of keeping myself grounded in making sure that I'm actually, you know, doing something that that is legitimate in some way. Uh, yeah. So I, that's the, like the long way I think to answer your question about do I think it's legitimate. Hmm. That's so fascinating. You know, it, the 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 correlation also to the the conspiracy thing is, is so fascinating to us. And I know we, we you know we're probably getting close on time here because we've we've uh, borrowed so much of your time already. But it's I'm, I'm uh, not in a hurry at all. This is actually very interesting. So if you guys, I, I, I know it's late I, for you guys. I, well, yeah. actually, I actually do the what you're. <sighs> I have to think about like how to formulate it because I I just thought of it like the the answer that you gave in the last conversation made me kind of like realize something and like I know even even our show like when we first learn about a subject I mean like we're a comedy education podcast so like we first comedy and the comedy comes first and we joke about that like in our part ones like we don't know anything so we're just having a good time we're taking the piss out of everything and then in part two it's like well we want to talk to people that actually like know about this stuff and like that's the education aspect like our conversation with you is like not only are we learning but like ideally our listeners are learning and, and something that is interesting to me is like you know we it reminds me of when we were uh, diving into demonolatry in the sense that like people i feel like are eager to dis we're eager to like disprove uh i i guess like that aspect of of um real the legitimacy of that religion. And it feels like with astrology, when I've been doing all this research, it seems like astrology has to do a lot of like fighting to have itself taken seriously. And I mean, like, you know, people are eager to like believe in it and philosophers, uh, psychologists, um, you know, scientists are, are all very eager to be like, the, you know, uh, shut up astrology, go over there. Um, everyone stop paying attention to it. And I'm just wondering, like, as an astrologer, like what it's like to be part of a community that like everyone actively tries to to delegitimize or uh, have, you know, thrown to the side or dis discarded, if you will. Yeah, I mean it sucks because it's a it's a marginal position to be in society where, like I said at the very beginning, you in some instances find yourself on the outs both with mainstream science as well as with religious many religious communities um and but especially the scientific community it sucks because i'm otherwise pretty normal and pretty like you guys in terms of like a, i'm in my mid 30s and grew up in in colorado in america in the 1990s and had a basic science education i tend to be more liberal in my policies in my politics and more focused on you know science education and stuff being cool. Like I grew up with like Bill Nye, and I like watching like the Cosmos series with not just Carl Sagan but also the the recent one by Neil, Neil deGrasse, deGrasse Tyson. Yeah. You know, I'm like a fan of all of that stuff, and it's hard then sometimes seeing um, being a fan of those things, and also not just being a fan but being pro some of those things, especially for example in the past year. Um, with some of the coronavirus um, denialism and some of the the conspiracy theories that that popped up surrounding that, you know, I I find some of that stuff like really offensive and really um, problematic. Uh, so it's difficult though. Then knowing, despite being in that position where I'm in, in many respects very similar to most people in America in terms of like mainstream science education and beliefs and everything like that, that. Um, my my views on astrology and my practice of astrology is something that would naturally strike most educated people as being really weird and being very 
potentially off-putting or making them have many assumptions about me and what I must think about the world or how out there I must be or, or whatever based on what their, their preconceptions of astrology are. And I do wish, I mean, all astrologers, this is probably a chip that all astrologers have on their shoulder to some extent, um, and it varies from astrologer to astrologer, but the desire to want to be taken more seriously or have more professional um, seen as professionals and having a legitimate um, professional field is something many astrologers want, but um, it's not something that's possible to the extent until astrology or unless astrology was, um, unless you identified a, a, a mechanism for it, like a causal mechanism that was causing it to work that could be replicated and demonstrated scientifically, statistically, astrology will never have that sort of validation in terms of modern day science, and therefore astrology will never have that validation in terms of academia or philosophy or anything else. It, it will always be this sort of outsider thing. So signing up for astrology, one of the downsides then, if you make that your profession or life's work, is it puts you on that the outside or the outskirts of you know intellectual history on some level, at least in in modern modern times. Yeah, that's so interesting. And you know, there was another question I had when we were talking earlier, and and you you just mentioning the you know astrology's place next to science. And I guess specifically, why why do you think it is that science rejects astrology in the way it does? Why why do they not coincide? What specifically? Um, it's really complicated because part of it just has to do with some cultural things that were happening during the scientific revolution, especially around the 17th century. And one of the issues, one of the core issues about why astrology fell out of favor is because remember, I talked about wanting there to be somebody like a polymath or a scientist, like a an astrologer version of like Stephen Hawking, basically, who could like create a grand grand unified field field theory that would explain astrology and how it integrates with science and our contemporary understanding of physics and everything else. So there was somebody that did that in the in the second century um, named Claudius Ptolemy, and he created a, a model where he was a polymath that studied. He wasn't just into astronomy and astrology, but he also wrote works on like optics and geography and music theory, harmonics, and like a bunch of other stuff. And he um, created a cosmological theory for um, the world and for physics, but that also explained how astrology worked and how it um, fit in with the prevailing scientific paradigm at the time. And his system then took off and became the prevailing paradigm for many centuries after that. But part of the problem is that even though his model made sense in terms of the prevailing scientific paradigm at the time, one of the problems is that um, it placed like the Earth at the center of the solar system. And so when you had some later discoveries, which placing the Earth at the center of the solar system is not necessary for astrology to work um, at all, but um, in his system, it kind of was required for the rationale to make sense. Um, so what happened is that through some of the discoveries that happened during the scientific revolution, and one of them being, you know, the sun being the center of the solar system, is suddenly virtually overnight, his model, his grand unified theory sort of imploded on itself and was disproven. So people said, well, if that was true, then that means also that astrology is false as well, because that entire our entire model for how it could work was just disproven overnight. And so it was never that astrology was disproven scientifically by like statistical studies back in the 17th century, because that's not what science was at that point in time, even though they were trending in the direction of, of experimentation and empiricism, but it was largely due to this shift that happened where the previous model for how astrology integrated with science and physics was disproven, so everybody just stopped believing in astrology who was educated at that point. So that's part of what you have to understand in the, about why astrology is on the outside of science and physics. It's because of that shift that happened somewhat radically or quickly in the 17th century. Um, 
And so that most skeptics and most scientists, if they ever ask questions about astrology or ever talk about it, they sort of will reject it out of hand at the very start, partially because there's no known mechanism for it. And that's like the the main like the holdup basically is the the loss of Ptolemy's model removed the mechanism for astrology where he conceptualized astrology as working through the influence of the planets and the stars on earth on earth and and on life on earth and everybody still thinks that that's the basic premise of astrology that the planets and stars influence life, life on earth earth based on Ptolemy's precedent even though most astrologers don't conceptualize astrology in that way but instead they think about it in terms of synchronicity and Symbolic thinking and what have you. Mm. That's a really so that interesting. Kind of, uh, yeah, that was kind of a long answer, but I just, yeah, that was just relative to your your question about sciences. We have to understand that um, it was never disproven necessarily. It was just that the cosmology changed. Eventually, later in the twentieth century, there have been a lot of statistical tests, or there have been some statistical tests that have been run on astrology, um, but. Or not just statistical, but other tests of like testing astrologers sometimes and their ability to read charts. Um, but none of that, none of the scientific stuff has worked out very well for astrologers. There was one study that worked out pretty well for a while, which was the studies by a French statistician named Michel Gauquelin and the Mars effect. And but even that was kind of a debacle because at one point he had supposedly found a correlation between. Eminence, em, eminent athletes who were all born, or at least a statistic, statistically large number of them were born with Mars either rising over the eastern horizon or culminating overhead at the moment of birth. And he said there was statistically more eminent athletes who were born with this position compared to other positions. And he put his results out and he asked for other scientific committees to attempt to replicate his study because that's what you would need to do to have it validated scientifically. And the problem initially is that one scientific skeptical group did it. They ran the study and they validated it and they came back with the same results. So then another skeptical group got involved and they ran the study and then much to their surprise and displeasure, they validated it and got the same results. But what what sucked about that is there ended up being a debacle because their initial impulse was this can't be true because astrology we know is false so we must have done something in the study wrong so we need to not release the results so they tried to bury the results for a number of years and it turned out in the in the end because there was an exposé where one of the people that was on this committee that was involved in this was really shocked that they were trying to bury the results because he didn't think this was in keeping with good scientific ethics and so he wrote about it years later um, what he said, the point that he made was they didn't need to do that because it turned out there was a flaw in how they had replicated the study. And once they did it correctly, the Mars effect disappeared and there was no statistical correlation with astrology. Mm. But his thing was, but despite that, um, they still tried to bury the study. And if they had just published it, um, that would have been the right thing to do. And then other people could have seen their mistake and fixed it, and it would have been fine. But the fact that their initial impulse was because astrology is wrong, we shouldn't publish anything that confirms otherwise, that that hinted at something that was problematic about the basic underlying premise that they were approaching the entire endeavor from. And it's something that I still think is an issue in terms of scientific testing of astrology in general. Yeah, you have the bias there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the bias and just the presumption that it's not exactly it's not yeah. valid, and other issues that sort of go along with that, which is is something you know you guys not run into, but that's interesting in the way that how you try to structure this sometimes in terms of checking yourself and your own biases going into things. It's interesting, yeah, because even you just saying that, I just like I, I think of all the different times where we're like, okay, well, this has to be this way, and then. We look into it, and then, like, even you saying this, I'm like, okay, well, can I, can I change my my opinions about all of these, like, my belief system regarding a specifically astrology? It's like, can I actually believe it? And it's like, well, I guess if I reevaluate all of these things, and I'm thinking now specifically of the scientists you mentioned who chose to not publish their things, I'm like, well, 
like, what would I do in that situation? Like, I have this belief system. It's rigid. It's fixed. And, you know, in, in a lot of ways, it defines me. I at least identify strongly with the set of beliefs that I've come to hold. And so it's interesting to see, you know, like th this, this effect or like this phenomenon happen other places. And of course, it makes sense. You know, we're all human. We're all governed by human minds that are, uh, you know, fallible in similar ways. So yeah, it's, inter well, it's interesting. It's yeah, just to, and just to kind of like you know write your coattails. Whenever we do these things, we always run into uh, all these questions we didn't anticipate. And at first, it was like, all right, what's the deal with astrology? And like by the end, I'm I'm asking myself, all right, how much do I know about science? Like, what do I know about science? How much do I know about psychology? What do I know about psychology? And like you know, again, like I uh, bumped into this article that said like psychology apparently is having a, a big reproduction problem with like most of its studies. A lot of them aren't making it past fifty percent of these things that the we kind of had built the foundation of a uh, psychology in. And it's like one of these things where it's like, come on, man. I started this because I was like, what's up with astrology? And now I'm like, is science real? It's like, well, that's not necessarily the debate, but it's like, all right, do I even know what science is? Is psychology real? And like, oh, I, I think when I first started this, my, my biggest preconception was just that like astrology was a toolkit for people that wanted to like you get a pre-packaged description of 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 your personality for for people that maybe don't want to necessarily do the messy work of of, of self definition and um I, that's kind of how I walked into it. it was like you should just go through astrology and like now I'm kind of of the belief that the self just shouldn't be defined at all like like I I think anytime someone asks like what sign you are what kind of person you are you should just be like let's talk about literally anything else because you know the no matter what you say you end up putting your foot in your mouth and, and second guessing it, whether or not that's really who you are so yeah i mean some some astrologers choose not to share their birth charts or their birth times for that reason because they don't want people other astrologers to um make assumptions about them although although it's funny about that is there's like this placement that keeps coming up over and over again that every astrologer i've met that um, doesn't want to share their birth time has, so that even that in of itself may be a sort of predisposition, which is kind of funny mm -hmm. uh, irony. Um, what was the last thing uh, that you said, Shay, before that? Because I thought there was a thread that, that was good to wrap up. Well, I was talking about um, the set of beliefs that we all hold and uh, how it is that, that just trying to shake those and the difficulties with that. I don't know um, if that's what you're talking about. So maybe yeah, like there was something there. Um, it was about just, um, you know, it's really hard because we all, ideally, you want to be able to say and be humble and and acknowledge the things that you don't know going into any situation, and therefore sometimes the best attitude to have is just, you know, I don't know. Like I don't know is truly the the neutral or the middle ground when you don't have su sufficient experience or expertise in a topic but it's hard because so much of the time in the modern world you know we need to be able to rely on authorities and we need to be able to rely on something on on science or scientific authorities in order to um live and survive and like do well and thrive in the world uh and just get by especially in the age of like for example like the coronavirus or something like that i don't think you know just being like i don't know is necessarily always healthy in some instances like that when it comes to like should I wear a mask or you know pretty soon like should I get the vaccine or run the risk of like you know getting sick with the virus or what have you in the future um so it's it's really truly tricky because there's a, a balance there of needing to uh find a middle ground between those two extremes yeah Absolutely. So yeah, from from this point forward, I don't know. It's going to be my my new magic <laughs> word. So again, uh, Chris, I just want to say thank you so much for taking time to talk to us today. Man, it was a, it was a great convo. Uh, I am walking away more knowledgeable than when I entered, which is always a win for me. So thanks again. Yeah, thank you. Very last question to both of you: Do both of you know your birth times? I do. You do? Yeah, I know. I know. I know mine too. Okay. Not, I don't do you, know exactly. Like it's it's relatively approximate, but it's pretty close. No, it's gotta, it's to gotta be exact. What's the cause there's always an issue about um some people get their birth time from their mother or from their parents and their parents' memory, but because it's kind of like a chaotic situation, sometimes the parents' memory can end up being off and they can misremember the exact time. Whereas usually like the birth certificate will have an exact time and, and most of the time other factors uh you know 
take in consideration, that's the best thing to go with. Do you know if your birth time's listed on your birth certificates? I don't know. I know. I you know. Now that you're saying that, I'm like, yeah, I know because my mom told me. So I'm wondering now if maybe yeah, I don't know. Yeah, my my mom. I asked her, and she went five thirty seven a.m. to the minute, and I was like, you know, she's like, I remember because you were huge and it was painful. And I was like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, that's pretty good. I mean, that's yeah. pretty reliable. Then, or it sounds like it, it would sounds be like yeah, yeah. traumatic. Yeah, <laughs> that's more Do so than want- mine. Uh, can I give you both copies of your birth certificates or, or of your birth charts? I should say, um, or would you like to either, you know, on the air now or off the air later, uh, get a copy of your birth chart? I don't know. You, I don't know, Ian. What do you I'm think? I'm down to do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm Let's do down. It. All right. So I'm not going to make any statements about it, uh, okay. but I will at least just like calculate it for you, so we can go through the process. Because one of the things we didn't do, but maybe could have do to ground the discussion about what we were even talking about when it comes to natal astrology or birth charts was like cast a birth chart. Um, okay, so let me start with Shay. Uh, and I'll share my screen once I have the actual chart up. Um, what's your birth date and year, Shay? You know, I normally don't give this out, but <laughs> you know, I, I will tell you. Uh, just have, uh, it's uh, it's well, amazing. And are, and are you sure? Because I don't want to pressure you, and that's something. Uh, uh, one of the ethics of astrology that I've been trying to be more careful about is some people don't want to share their birth charts or their birth times. Um, most astrologers are fine doing it, uh, but I don't want to pressure anyone into doing it. So it's really okay if you don't. Um, you know what? I actually would actually rather keep it a secret. You know, and it's not. I'm, okay. I'll tell everyone I'm 31. Like, oh, wait, no, I'm 30. I'll be turning 31 <laughs> soon. But, um, uh, but yeah, I don't know why it is. You know, there's something about like putting out my my information now. I'm just like, I don't know. Do I want that out there? I don't know. We also just did a, a whole camp on uh, privacy, basically through the Truman Show. Mm-hmm. So now I'm a little bit more skeptic. Yeah. Skeptical. Sure. I'll, I'll do it because I'm a sign slut. I'll do it. I'll be the. <laughs> okay. I'll I'll be. I'll just fall on the 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 time grenade. I love it. Okay. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> What's your birthday? It's uh May twenty fourth, nineteen eighty eight. Okay. My social uh, security number is no. Sorry. Right. <laughs> blood, <laughs> blood type and uh, Facebook password is also required for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mother's uh, maiden name. What's the birth time again? <laughs> 5.37 a.m. And what's the city that you were born in? Uh, Laguna Niguel, uh, California. And How do you if you, uh, spell that? La, L-A-G-U-N-A. Okay. Uh, I think it's N-I-G-E-L. Ian, I had no idea you were from California. How did you not know? We have I, a podcast <laughs> together, man. I really don't know how I didn't know this. That's uh, actually shocking to me. Yeah, I was. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not a Florida native. I, I had no idea. Okay. Wow. Um, for some reason, it's not coming up. Let me Google it and see. Yeah, look, maybe I'm spelling it wrong. Oh, there's a there's a U. There's a stray U in there. Ah, curse, there, there curse you, Laguna Niguel. It looks yeah. beautiful, Ian. I'm looking at it on Google Maps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah, we were... fell from grace. My family did. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I believe came that. swamp people. Oh, wow. So okay. as long as I have this right, it's uh, May 24th, 1988, 5.37 yeah. a.m., uh, oh, Laguna Niguel, yeah. California, right? Wow. Yeah, that's right. That's right, because okay. I used to I used to remember, remind myself how to spell it by calling it Niguel. So. <laughs> nice. Yeah. yeah, there's that missing like, you. Yeah, that yeah. I, yeah. Just like um, I say, I spell Wednesday. So, I'm sorry, go ahead. I do that too. So <laughs> one of the issues, and this is why the birth time is super important, is um, over on the left, the, the symbol that says AS, that's your ascendant or your rising sign. Okay. And it's at, it's at zero degrees and zero minutes of Gemini, which means that it just maybe a minute or two earlier flipped from, from Taurus to Gemini. And that would be something that would change your chart in a major way. Let me actually, yeah. I'll animate it to show you. Um, oh, cool. So, one of the cool things that astrology programs can do is that you can move. The charts forward or backwards so that you can look what it was like either five minutes earlier or you know five years earlier or what have you. Yeah. So um, so here's this is your chart for 537, but if I move it back to 536, oh it's totally see, different. It switches and it flips because the ascendant moves into Taurus and it changes the house placements of all of the planets. So what's unfortunately 
annoying about that is then there's going to be a genuine um, issue where you could have one chart or the other simply just based on if you happen to be born you know, in one minute or another. Um, and normally, this is an issue where if you were like a client, if you were going to an astrologer, or if you became a student of astrology and wanted to study your chart on your own, one of your first issues is that you would have to employ a process called rectification where you try to figure out which is the correct birth time by comparing the two and, and basically attempting to see which one fits you better. Yeah. Wow. So, so I'm just saying that because that then is for you going to be unique and creating a com uh, complication where for mo most people, or at least for a lot of people, you know, they would just calculate it. And if it was like, let's say an hour earlier, if your ascendant was at 16 Gemini, that's not going anywhere. And the difference of a minute is not going to change anything radical in your chart for the most part. Yeah. But for you, um, this would be an issue in terms of studying the chart where you'd have to begin first make sure that you're actually using the right chart because you could actually be using the wrong chart and that's obviously then not going to be as impressive if you're interpreting the wrong chart versus the right one theoretically again if this is a valid phenomenon yeah wow i did not realize it was this in depth i mean i've seen some of, i've seen like these charts online before but i didn't, I didn't realize, realize yeah, that like the the, di the, the difference one this. minute can make yeah, yeah that's crazy yeah, yeah so it's it's really important and that's why you know, and that's the difference between you know a sun sign horoscope, which is just like the day you were born and the the sign that the sun was located in, which in this case is Gemini. We can see the sun as the little symbol with a circle and a dot in the middle over on the left, and that's in the sign of Gemini. But then there's a bunch of other planets and other celestial bodies. Like the moon is down at the bottom of the chart at 12 degrees of Virgo, so that's in a in a different sign. Or Venus is in the bottom left. It looks like the symbol for uh, a woman or for a female at zero degrees of Cancer, and it's opposite to there was a conjunction of Saturn and Uranus and Neptune up in Capricorn in the top right of your chart. That was a conjunction that was happening in the 1980s that coincided with the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, that one astrologer earlier in the decade that did mundane astrology actually predicted several years in advance. Um, yeah, so there's there's just a bunch a bunch of different planets in different parts of the chart in different signs, and then they also have different configurations to each other or aspects, which are like ways that the planets interact with each other in different ways, um, which are some of the blue and red lines in the middle of the chart. Uh, and then on top of that, there's also it's not displayed very well in this chart, but there's different houses. There's 12 different sectors of the chart which are thought to represent different parts of the life. Um, so, for example, the 10th house is up at the very top of the chart, and that's supposed to represent a person's career because the top of the chart is where the sun reaches at noon in the middle of the day when it's at its highest and most visible. So, the top of the chart, therefore, symbolically is thought to indicate um, where a person is most visible in terms of their career and their public life. Versus opposite to that, at the very bottom of the chart where we see the moon, that's the fourth house, which is the sector that has to do with one's home and living situation and private life, because that's opposite symbolically to the most visible or public part of the chart. So the opposite of that would be then the private life and where you live and where you sleep and things like that. Mm. So there's different, I wanted to mention that just because that's just giving you a breakdown of some of the components of the chart, but also again, Extending that idea of symbolic thinking and how some of these factors in the chart are based on symbolic interpretations of, like, you know, visibility of being at the very top of the chart and being the most visible, therefore rep representing your public life versus being hidden at the bottom of the chart and representing your private life or what have you. Mm. Wow. It's there's so much to it. It's crazy. You know, it's it, we this happens to us all the time where we we dive into a subject and we're like, we're going to learn so much in these two weeks. And it's true. We do learn a lot. But, there's, you know, it's crazy how deep uh, astrology is. And um, honestly, uh, thank you so much, Chris, for teaching us everything you did and answering all these questions so thoroughly and um, giving us such a um, thorough and nuanced explanation for all of this. It really honestly, I, uh, I yeah, I'm at a loss for words. Thank you so much. 
yeah, thanks for the questions. Thanks for spending the extra time with me tonight. And um, yeah, good luck with your whatever remaining investigation you do of astrology, or good luck in your investigations in general with the podcast in the future. I look forward to tuning in. So uh, thanks a lot. All right, thanks, man. We appreciate it. Take care. Have a good rest of the night. Thanks to all the patrons that supported the production of this episode of the podcast through our page on Patreon. In particular, thanks to the patrons on our producers tier, including Nate Craddock, Marin Altman, Thomas Miller, Catherine Conroy, Michelle Marilot, Christy Moe, Ariana Amore, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Sumo Kopic, and Nadia Habhab. For more information about how to become a patron or have your name listed in the credits, please visit patreon.com slash astrologypodcast. Also, special thanks to our sponsors, including the Northwest Astrological Conference, which is happening online May 27th through the 31st, 2021. Find out more information at norwak.net. The Mountain Astrologer Magazine, which you can find out more information about at mountainastrologer.com. The ISAR Astrology Conference, happening August 18th through the 22nd, 2021. More information at isar2020.org. The Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs, which you can find out more information about at honeycomb.co. Also, the Portland School of Astrology, more information at portlandastrology.org. The Astral Gold Astrology app, available for both iPhone and Android, available at astrogold.io. And finally, the primary software program that we use on episodes of the Astrology Podcast is called Solar Fire Astrology Software, which is available at alabe.com, and you can get a 15% discount with the promo code AP15.